I work hard for my results and I need my diet dialed in. The RP Diet app tells me what to eat to keep me on track and offers suggestions for changes based on my responses, giving me the freedom to choose my path. A personal digital diet coach for less than $15 a month? Yeah, that works. Folks, welcome back. Weekly webinar, Dr. Mike, Dr. James, here to answer questions as always. Mike, how you doing? Booyah kasha, respect. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Thanks, man. I'm just trying my Ollie G, always trying to be best at that. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a pretty long, lengthy list of questions this week, so I figure we might as well just jump right into it. Uh, for you guys who are watching as we kind of get set up here, next week, Mike and I are actually going to be on vacation, so I'm giving you a heads up now at the beginning of the webinar, I'll remind you at the end, we may be either off schedule or we might just kind of have a week off for this upcoming week, depending on what we end up doing. Sometimes we get ambitious and say, oh yeah, we'll do a webinar. And then we just end up not doing it because we're doing something yeah, else. Yeah, Wi-Fi so, sucks or something. Exactly. So for now, we'll say plan on probably missing a, an episode uh, this upcoming week. And then we'll be back on our normal schedule after that. Yep. Okay. First up is, we ready to go, James? Ready to go. Sean Murakai Rubin says, I think this question will get bundled with my question from last week since I ended up being uh, the cutoff point. Uh, no, I guess he wasn't, right? So I won't repeat hello guys a second time since it was probably already right a few minutes ago, but hi again. Number two, for late beginners, early intermediates who may just be on the cusp slash border of still being able to put on a little bit of muscle while cutting, should they actually try to do that? Or would it almost uh, be better to save the anabolicness for the subsequent bulk? So possibly sacrificing a small amount of potential muscle in a short run to get a resensitization effect and maybe get a sort of two for one benefit of the cut. Do you think one might uh, net slightly more muscle overall or would it be pretty much a wash in the long run? Not really uh, matter which one you choose. Thank you to as always. So I'll, I'll give an answer that I think um, makes some sense. The, the, the first thing I have to say is this. Uh, when you're on a cut, you move from MEV to MRV anyway. Uh, it just so happens that your MEV, uh, like your MRV, your MEV climbs and your MRV comes down to you because that move isn't very long. And, and you know that move isn't going to be very long. Maybe if you traditionally progressed, like are you doing a bulk, it might be two weeks instead of four for each mesocycle. So you know that in advance, which is why you reduce the uh, volume and intensity progressions in magnitude on a cut. So you still progress, but it's more slowly. And if you realize you're really, really fatigued when cutting, you can progress them almost not at all. So you just essentially hang in there and maybe progress just, uh, just loading and don't even progress set numbers and just progress RIR. Um, and maybe like add a rep here and there. So because you're still making progressions as much as you can to fit a certain mesocycle length, like at least a four to one, for example, and because you would do that anyway in a muscle gain phase, you would just be able to progress longer and bigger and actually gain muscle. You're already doing everything in training that you would anyway to gain muscle. The only thing you could do differently is prioritize a muscle group uh, during a cut. That's not a good idea because then you end up saying, okay, well, the other ones have to go to maintenance volume, which really is equivalent to minimum effective volume when you're in our cut. And this prioritized muscle, we're going to start at minimum effective volume. So it ends up just being the same thing. So um, I would say that you end up running outside of a prioritization, which you shouldn't be doing, but that's a self-correcting problem because if you try it, it won't work. Um, it's really like you just train the same and whether or not you gain muscle is a result of the process, not something you sort of plan in advance. People who move from MEV to MRV and actually get quite a bit of volume in and actually progress, like, wow, I gain muscle, like, sweet. But sometimes that just doesn't happen. So you essentially sort of design your program in very much the same way, but the result of the progression may be different on cutting. And then so you'd have first cut, you could gain a lot of muscle. Fourth cut, you could gain very little. And 10th cut, you could gain nothing. And 15th cut, you could lose a little bit. But that just tends to happen uh, sort of naturally just with normal training design. And there's not really a flip the switch of let's bulk and cut at the same, or let's gain muscle during a cut. So I don't think you're going to be doing a lot of stuff differently. Um, if there are some levers to pull differently, which I'm maybe not thinking of, maybe James will think of some, but maybe you will, Sean, um, then I would actually say it's probably not a good idea to pull those levers during a cut for someone, a late uh, beginner or late, uh, yeah, late beginner, early intermediate, um, because, uh, you do get your best results momentum wise, tissue wise, et cetera, when you're muscle gain phase. And I would just do the cuts 
shorter with less volume, less injurious, less fatigue, finish cutting in six weeks instead of eight because you're not pushing it as hard and don't have to take as many weird deloads and stuff. Get over it. The cut, just use a cut for pure body fat loss and then get back to the real good old days when you're muscle gaining and everything is so super ideal. And you'll tend to notice that with a lot of sports, specificity ends up becoming more and more important as the athlete progresses. And a part of specificity, we could, I guess you could say it's face potentiation becomes more important in a sense that you're either doing something really, really well or and not doing a whole lot of anything else, or you're doing something else really well, not a whole lot of anything else. So I would say that that's probably with the direction you want to hit into if you have levers to pull. I just don't think you have that many levers to pull, and it's a self-solving problem, James. Yeah, I think you nailed it pretty pretty well there. So kind of just to reiterate what Mike said, usually we don't really think about gaining muscle during a cut, even if that is something that does happen. So it's more of like a bonus, like, all right, cool, like that, that worked out great. I think what is kind of an interesting point is like you might do things in cutting, like the really, really hard training that you do, even within the, the smaller MEV to MRV window, if you do really, really hard training, Training, you might be setting yourself up for muscle gains that actually express later on. I don't know this to be true, yep. but I suspect, right? So you might have something Relates like satellite. Relates to our next question, actually. Yeah. So you might have like satellite cell proliferation occurring from a really hard training stimulus that cannot phenotypically express until energy conditions are in a better spot, right? And so later on, like you did this hard training, you have like a... Uh, a, genoty a genotypical change that hasn't been able to manifest into phenotypical changes later on. That is, a, that is something that's possible. I don't really know a ton about that, but that would be an instance where it's, it might be in your interest to train hard during cuts, minus like the mini cut examples that we give where we say back off a little bit. Uh, but training hard during a cut's probably a good idea. It probably helps net you more muscle in the long term anyway, but you don't really change what you're doing. You just still do the same stuff. Yeah, great, great, great. Related question, uh, sort of from fictional funkness, Thanks for trying to answer my question last week. I either used the wrong terminology or had a mistaken premise, so please allow me to try again. Oh, good. In the lectures on nutrition for muscle gain, Dr. Mike says that too short a mass phase risk generating only preparatory gains, not contractile tissue, and that the cut right after massing can interfere with lagging hypertrophy. Later, he suggests that a month or two of maintenance can help to allow the body to readjust its settling point, but although he mentions preparatory growth and lagging contractile tissue growth at the same time, it's not clear if the same uh, one or two month suggestion applies. Finally, in the post-show periodization example, uh, there are maintenance phases of two or four weeks after gaining phases, but also mini cuts uh, that last four weeks. I'm not sure how I should apply that advice as I plan my diet for the coming year in which I'd like to spend as much time possible massing, but still leave time to com uh, comfortably cut back into my weight class. So um, he has another question there, but I will uh, address that in a sec. So uh, here, here's the, the, the best answer I can give is it's all a matter of duration and magnitude. If you gain a lot of muscle over a long muscle gain phase, you probably can benefit from a longer maintenance phase and a shorter cutting phase at the end or a less extreme cutting phase at the end, and you'll keep more of that muscle. If you, on the other hand, uh, you know, if you have a short muscle gain phase and a very long, very nasty, very go down to low body weight and body fat cut after, that really highly risks you. So you'll notice that in our uh, mini cut manual sample periodization, you'll have mass phases and then just really, really short maintenance phases and then mini cuts. The thing with mini cuts is they really don't risk muscle loss much because they're so short and because they're not taking you to super lean body fat levels and they're not extremely fatiguing. Before you do one of those cuts, you had better settle everything in after a long massing phase with a nice long one to two month maintenance phase or some uh, other phase in which you don't lose a ton of body weight. Um, so we really, really warn against us doing a huge mass or actually the worst possible thing, super fast, super short mass, and then a super crazy cut. You'll they, they likely, uh. maintain, yeah, that's it, right? Because <laughs> uh, people will say that, right? They'll be like, I I'm dieting for six months. And then I want to mass for like three weeks and then I want to diet for another four months. So we're like, you might as well just not mass. And they're like, well, what's better? Like just maintain and relax. And they're like, well, why not mass? Because you're not going to keep any of that shit. All right. And you're stressing your body with more training volume and more psychological, you know, uh, sort of pressure than you need to be. You know, just, just chill. Um, on the other hand, you know, the best way to do it is to mass for a long time and then do little tiny mini cuts with, and then you need very little maintaining because you get right back to massing after and everything goes well. Of course, every now and again, mini cuts don't work. You have to do a regular cut, but that regular cut should come after a more extended um, maintenance phase, which as you'll notice in the mini cut manual, it absolutely does. And then even after that uh, cutting phase, you might take another maintenance phase just to get your body prepped for massing again, um, drop. James, 
sorry, the audio cut off on that last part just a little. Can you just reiterate like the last 15 seconds? Yeah, am I back? You're back. So, yeah. So if you, uh, in, in the mini cut manual, you see that before a longer uh, cutting phase, we do have programmed longer maintenance phase, uh, which you should take. And then you might even take a maintenance phase after that, or shortly after that longer cut to really drop the fatigue from the cut and really let you uh, do a good job muscle gaining again. Yeah, that sounds great. I actually don't have any additions. You nailed it. Cool. Next question from fictional funkness is, have you ever heard of someone getting acne because of cutting? No. Do you have any <laughs> strategies for preventing acne? No. I'm sorry. I, I hope somebody. I honestly can't think. Of, I mean, I know some people are prone to acne, like when they're stressed, right? And that could be something related, but. I, Wait I a minute. I have to answer this. Fictional functus, what you want to do is go follow Stephen DeVos, the lifting dermatologist on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Not That's a joke. Right. That's a real person. Yeah. And tell him you uh, are an RP Plus member and you, uh, Mike and James sent us over. He may be able to answer your question in a Q&A he has. He may be able to answer in a YouTube comment. He might even message you. Literally his career, he is a board certified der dermatologist, I believe in either Belgium or Switzerland or somewhere over there, super sharp guy. And he is super jacked, <laughs> super lean and been training for 20 plus years and has a YouTube channel about uh, gaining muscle and losing fat. And he's a dermatologist. If he doesn't know this, nobody does. <laughs> yeah. So that's the guy. Definitely. So that was a good remember on your part. Yeah. So they, just, they do a lot of cool stuff. He talks a lot about like TRT and some other stuff. Totally. Yep. Yeah. The lifting dermatologist, uh, Stephen DeVos on YouTube. Go, go. Sean, Shansom. I always thought it was Sansom. I know. Every time I read that, I'm like, Shanasi, Samson, Sam, Sam, Shit. Hi, docs. I've been recently running a fat loss phase and I found myself needing to cut my vasos a little shorter than expected, three to four weeks, but mostly due to joint and connective tissue pain in the upper limbs. I suspect that after two vasos and fat loss, I've probably tried to push my body, too many body parts from MED to MRV. At the same time, for Meso 2, I had a pretty good groove in my hamstrings and quad training. So for my last week of Meso 2, week 4, I decided to ease back on the upper body intensities and push my leg training hard for one more week. Curious if this approach of backing off on some body parts mid-Meso in order to push extend the Meso for other body parts makes sense. For more context, I've been trying to push quads, hamstrings, biceps, triceps, chest, and back from MVP and MRV while cutting. I've been aiming for about two sets shy of reference for MRV, uh, for my MRV on fat loss. Abs, front delts, and side, and rear delts have been about MVMED. I do not. Uh, I do no direct glutes, traps, or calves, but I still deadlift twice a week. That's a lot of deadlifting. Um, I was going to say, I, yeah. that, you definitely do do glutes and traps deadlifting twice a week. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I aim to get two bouts a week of light sled push for cardio, but it's usually a pain in the ass to set up a barbell brigade. Uh, so I often just try to walk or hike more if I can. It's good. Walking or hiking is better fat loss yeah. anyway. Uh, my third and final meso of fat loss, I'm going to take a more conservative approach and put triceps on the back burner as well. Any general thoughts on so, this? You may change. Um, I, let's I back will up say to the first part. Yeah. So I got lost um, in there. The first part is asking about backing off of some stuff while pushing mid meso, basically. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I don't think that's the best idea because it introduces a level of complexity to your training that becomes thing, it makes things difficult to track. Um, also, when you're in a fat loss phase, you don't have to worry about pushing anything because per the earlier question for Sean um, Rokawa, um, I think that pushing things out of cut is not the best time to push them. It's better to push them out of mass. So I would say that you should take all of your body parts and put them between MEV and MRV and very slowly add in volume. And if you know that your um, connective tissue pain is going to be a problem at certain volumes for your upper limbs or your <laughs> uh, upper body, then I would just stay away from that. Uh, and sort of push until it gets close to that and then don't push anymore. And if you're still pushing your legs as part of the normal plan, they can still sort of go, yeah, just add, you know, loading uh, and produce RIR for your upper body. So they basically just have two independent MRVs and that's totally fine, but I wouldn't artificially extend or artificially pull back on anything and make a very, very disparate push. 
Yeah, so I think instead of trying to adjust your mesocycle length or anything along those lines, I think what you might consider doing is changing the exercises, obviously, that are seems to be exacerbating the pain. Um, and then also consider using a, lo a lower frequency of training. It sounds like you maybe are just having too many overlapping sessions if you're consistently getting like joint pain that's holding you back from doing mesos. So if you're training triceps, you know, three times a week, get it down to two. If you're training biceps, you know, four times, get it down to two or three. See if that helps. You know, if, it, if I, I don't remember if you said elbows specifically, but uh, joint and connective tissue pain in the upper limbs. Yeah. So I would say maybe dial down your frequency a little bit, see if that helps. That uh, might be also giving you some problems. Yep. Uh, and then he says, you may recall I asked a question a while back about leg size strength discrepancies. Interesting. I've noticed my leg strength discrepancy has almost entirely disappeared on the cut. All the discrepancy has not changed. Size discrepancy did you, has not did, changed. Did you, I was going to say, did you have one really fat leg and one like uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> To be clear, I haven't yet altered leg training to correct the discrepancy. Would you expect strength discrepancies to be minimized on a cut? Any physiological rationale you could think for this? Wait. Um, my physiological rationale for this is that on a cut, you do potentially more cardio and the leg that does, uh, you know, you've increased cardio on both legs and the cardio might have become more fatiguing than that good leg is used to. And it had a fiber type conversion more than the other leg, which you might use more. Um, but that's a very speculative thing. Um, no clue about what we really would expect. Um, and I wouldn't worry about any of this stuff, man. If you want to fix it, you know how to fix it. And usually these strength and size discrepancies are wholly irrelevant anyway. Um, you know, I would also say it could be, you know, of course it could, it could be a thousand different things, but you know, sometimes like, for example, if you pick a movement and you start noticing, like you, you pick a movement and you're going to use it for the next several mesocycles, like a squat, for example, and you're like, oh man, I'm really leaning on one side or I can feel like there's like a definite discrepancy in my technique or in my strength on, you know, one side, sometimes just doing it for three mesos in a row slowly, but surely starts correcting itself into a more symmetrical kind of configuration while you're doing the exercise. So I would also just posit that it might not be the cut itself, but just like sticking with an exercise long enough to make a long-term uh, either muscular strength and or technique adjustments to the movements and just kind of bouncing out a little bit that that is feasible. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Declan Ward says, hello, hello. First off a question of weightlifting programming. Oh, power boy. variations, power snatch, less cleaner staples in traditional weightlifting programs is there lighter on fatigue than full lift while still providing stimulus. If you were to put a percent on how you would, how do you think they would compare to the full lifts in terms of stimulus and fatigue? A lifter with a high strength reserve, uh, clean and jerk to squat ratio uh, would receive less of a stimulus. Well, hold on a sec. A high strength reserve is actually a low clean and jerk to squat ratio. Isn't that true, James? That's what I was thinking, actually. I was, I was, re I was yes. doing a read because I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Squat to clean and jerk ratio is strength reserve. I think strength reserve means like if you just squat. strong. Six, yeah, if you squat 400 kilos, but you clean 100 kilos, you have a big strength reserve. <laughs> it's the other way around. It's the other way around. So I think it's the squat to clean and jerk ratio. But um, Same, we got so yeah. It, yeah, lifter with a high strength reserve would – receive less of a stimulus from traditional lifts than someone with a oh, lower... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think he had the right idea, just put it backwards, but... Yeah, then with a lower strength reserve, so uh, less of a stimulus, yeah. So would power variations even be worthwhile in the program until their classic lifts have improved? Certainly less worthwhile, um, but generally speaking, uh, so it, it also... So, so some people... You get some lifters who have a really gnarly strength reserve, but they actually aren't that good at the power moves. Um, and some people who have a gnarly strength reserve that are good at the power moves. Some people just like the power, you know, they're just better at the power moves. Um, and some people are better at full lifts. Um, uh, if I was to put a percent on how uh, they would compare a stimulus and fatigue, I have absolutely no idea. James, do you know? I mean, it would just totally be bullshit on my part. I, I, it's it's clear to me that, yeah, the power movements, because you don't have to go through the full ROM, you don't have to absorb the full impact of the lift, just doing the lift itself. It's definitely less fatiguing than the full yeah. movements themselves. We can all agree on that. How much? I'm not sure. What's interesting, though, is there's this is, this is like classic sports science stuff that Mike and I had just shoved down our throats at nauseum when we were in school. It doesn't really matter if you do the full movement, uh, the power movement or even a derivative movement, what we find is that the actual second pull movement tends to generate 
pretty damn near the same power outputs. And that's the, really the, the, the trainable portion of that lift is that second pole derivative, right? So if you put somebody on a force plate and say, do a full clean, do a power clean, do a, you know, a clean from hang, do just a, a clean pull from pins, right? The power output from the second pole ends up being sometimes not even statistically different in many cases across that whole spectrum. So you could definitely make a case and say it's a better SFR, at least in terms of like power production in many cases, not all cases, but def definitely a case could be made there. Quantifying that, man, I have no idea. It really depends on to like the anthropometry of the lifter, you know, the impacts that they have to absorb, stuff like that. Like if you have like a, a, a really short and stocky guy versus like a guy with really long arms and legs, it's going to be completely different. It's really hard yeah. to say. You should uh, be very attuned in your own training of what for you the SFR will be compared to full lift because it should be pretty obvious after a couple of weeks of training. So I think what we could say, I think what a reasonable point to leave off on there is to say like, if you're just looking for the power stimulus, it, it, literally like you're training the power portion of that, not emphasizing like the mm -hmm. technique requirement necessarily, that would maybe be a better SFR choice than doing mm -hmm. a full lift, right? But if technique is something that continues to be a, a, an ongoing refinement or struggle, then you're actually making a, a, a trade off in terms of power output at the cost of, you know, maintaining perfect technique under close to maximal loading, which in weightlifting is arguably more important in many cases. So you can yeah. go either direction. So I think having like that needs analysis idea of like, where is my guy really lacking? Is he just not explosive or does he suck at the lift? That might help you make those decisions. Yeah. Then on a deal of the week following a week of overreaching, our energy demands raised in order to fuel supercompensation or should you just be aiming to get in the same amount of calories as you would on a day with a similar workout on a normal week during uh, the meso. Um, so it, there is some reason to think that there are elevated. Um, Broderick Chavez would say that for the first two or three days of a deload, you should do a little bit more than usual because you're still fucked up. But the way I would do it is the, the, uh, the average answer is no, just keep it simple and the same. You're going to lose out on almost nothing. If you want the bonus points of being super attentive to theory, what I would do is while you're still sore, uh, from the last week's overreaching and still super notably fatigued energy wise, eat more. And then, you know, halfway through your deload or a third through your deload, you'll know when you're no longer sore. You're like, man, I can't wait to eat these three double cheeseburgers. They're going to go to my muscles. And your body's like, really to your muscles? And you're like, no, okay, just kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm done recovering. So you could scale it to that. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to throw something in there and I feel like you're going to jump on this and, and be all over it. But I think during a cut, there is, uh, there are some psychological downsides to potentially using that strategy. I think during like a mass or maintenance phase, it's completely fine. But during a cut, you might actually FPRH yourself back into rebound weight gaining too much yeah. if you just are not careful and you say like, "Oh, I'm going to eat more because it's deload time." It's like, well, you yeah. still actually haven't really kind of leveled out yet from your cut. So now you're like, oh, "I'm going to eat ah because I need to recover more." And it's like, "Yeah, but and I just took off and gained a bunch of rebound weight for 100%. no good reason." So. And also like the FPRH part of it too, where it's like, now you're actually just inciting these like ravenous cravings in yourself. And for the next two weeks, you might just be like, oh, I can't take it anymore. Pizza, buffet, you know, like, so I think cutting is a unique in that regard. Whereas I don't think that problem is quite as evident on massing or maintenance, but just, just something to think about. Yep. All right. Jason Koshy says, hi, jump guy here. Jump hi, guy. So many nuggets of wisdom. One of the valuable things about this forum is that you don't just answer my questions, you challenge my assumptions. It helps quite a bit in optimizing my approach. Well, we can't very well answer your questions correctly if we don't challenge the assumptions we don't think are right on the money. <laughs> um, questions. Number one, thank you for clarifying that 3 by 3 is not the same as 3RM for triples. My dumb ass would have tried to hit the 3RM. This would be in the power <laughs> phase. I didn't type my question correctly, which led to confusion. Seconds, oh, sec versus sets. Oh, yeah. question is, while in a power phase, I'm maintaining strength, how many times a week should I be doing three by three? Assuming once, but I would like to clarify and perhaps here are the principles to consider also three by three heavier squats. Uh, are three by three heavier squats sufficient for total leg MV? We'll be doing a sprinting and jumping as well. In the context of sprinting and jumping, almost certainly. Yeah. Uh, and if you're maintaining, you have know, nothing to worry about. And yeah, I would say once a week is fine in many cases, James. Yeah, I'm, I'm just assuming he means doing three by three like heavy squats, not three by three like other stuff, right? That's yeah. that's what okay. That's yeah, correct. Totally. Yeah. So that that's good in terms of frequency, and that's good, very likely good in terms of maintenance volume. I have a really hard time imagining that you'd have any maintenance related yeah. issues at that point. 
Number two, you had a good discussion last week regarding three key training modalities along the force velocity curve, high force, strength, power variant, jumping. Um, is it appropriate that as I program along the force velocity curve, a simple approach would be to hit high force power jumping in each mile cycle, but shifting the priority depending where I am in the force velocity curve? Yes. Example below of what I'm thinking. Take a look at your example. The answer is yes, but let's see if your example fits. Um, three that's, day training. That's, that's phase potentiation. Really, literally. Three-day training, strength block, uh, focus on strength the first two days, power weight of best jumping in the later in the week. Power block, earlier in the week, power, ballistic squats, midweek jumping, weighted vest, later week strength, triples here, continue progressively overload. Uh, well, you would still progressively overload in triples as adaptation. So that sounds fine. Jump block, uh, earlier in the week, jumping, jump volume and dunk technique, midweek, power, later week strength. Oh, um, nails it. Uh, yeah, that's really good. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically like, I know we're, we tend to talk more about physique stuff. So like you guys have heard Dr. Mike talk about using a blend of the, the generalized repetition ranges. It's basically that same idea, yeah. right? Applied to a sporting context where you have different loading zones. It's not that you only do one loading zone. It's that one is generally prioritized over the others. Now the kind of sprint, uh, speed and power stuff are kind of unique in that you, you, you literally can't train them all the time, but you can keep kind of like a maintenance volume of just familiarity with the technique and the proprioception and the feel for the movements uh, in, in the mix. But you don't necessarily train them all year, but you kind of keep them fresh. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you nailed it. That was really good. Uh, just one, one last thing to add. You know, you can also modulate and should volu modulate volume and intensity within each session. So it's not just that you have the different sessions. It's also that you have, um, you know, like on your strength in the first two days strength block, you might do quite a bit of strength volume. And then your weighted vest jumping later in the week could just be very, very low volume jumping. So you can save yourself for your strength. In your power block, you might do less, even in your strength work, you might do a few less sets per session and you might do more jumping when you do the jumping and so on and so forth. So it's not just the frequency that is altered. It is the per session volume and per session intensity that can alter as well. Yeah, absolutely agree. I'm going to reach down and grab low. It's, there's, there's like madness going on in my house right now. Oh, uh, uh, there we go. He's like flipping out. So I'm just grabbing uh, it. Wait a minute. Can say hi. There. All right. Who's my Point job? number three. Well, James, you're screen sharing, so we can't say hi. Oh, crap. All right, real quick. For the viewers at home, here's my big He's so boy. lazy looking. He's the laziest man ever. Okay, got that out of the way. Sorry, it was like everyone was yelling and screaming and Lo was panicking. Oh, here he yep, goes. Oh, he right. was panicked pretty well. All right, number three. Really interesting points in the evidence regarding transfer of weighted jumps and optimal weight range, 10%. Most couch experts say up to 30% of 1RM squat for weighted jumping. Uh, they mistook that because it was 30% of load, but your body weight, if you're a two time body weight squatter, your body weight's 30%. So yeah. yeah, easy mistake to make for sure. Yep. However, context is king. And it is fair to say that, uh, this is appropriate if you're in the middle portion of the first velocity curve transitioning period from strength to speed. And is it fair to say this? is the appropriate if you're in the middle portion of the force velocity curve transition from strength to speed. Uh, so is he, is, he, is he asking, is using 30% appropriate when making that transition? Is that the question? Or am I, I think it is 10% appropriate. Um, so weighted jumps with 10% uh, and less is, I would say training for both power and speed. But if you're doing a like Olympic weightlifting derivatives, then it, it is 30% of your, um, you know, your full ability to, to do that lift. Um, Excuse me. So, you know, we need a little bit more context on what you're asking. Is it for power enhancement or is it for optimal jumping? And yeah. So like, you know, um, this is where it kind of gets nitpicky between like, are you training for power or speed? Like in many cases, yeah. you know, jumping and sprinting can kind of be synonymous with both, you know, in many instances. So in this case, like the loaded jump would be more of a power type activity and the unloaded yeah. jump would be more of like the speed type <laughs> activity. Yeah. So um, yeah, you could definitely use the loaded jump uh, like during a transition period where you're kind of like emphasizing power before you're moving into like your unloaded, just, pure fast explosive movement block and that would be fine yep 
I'm gonna uh, I, I'm gonna mute myself. I have to ask Mel something. Sorry. Can I keep going or? Yeah, please do. Taper versus deload. What are the differences? For instance, if before my final dunk week I end on a deload, is there any real difference between this and a taper? So. Um, a deload's job is to drop fatigue while conserving uh, adaptations, which means it can be very general and it could be a lot of a drop. Um, the taper is something that drops fatigue plenty, but really seeks to uh, keep very specific adaptations. So in a taper, you would do a lot more of the competitive activity during the taper. On a deload, you might do very little or none of the competitive activity. Um, also, uh, deloading is long enough to buy you another mesocycle. Uh, or, or enough fatigue reduction. Tapering is enough fatigue reduction to maximize performance. In beginning lifters and athletes, the deload and taper might be the same thing. Uh, in uh, even for power and speed and beginning athletes, the taper uh, might last only two or three days and the deload might last longer actually. Um, but uh, in advanced athletes, usually the tapers start to get longer than the deloads in order to do what they have to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sounds like he got that covered pretty good. Number five. Thanks for recommendation uh, regarding using a 10% body weight versus jumping. I'll incorporate that when I start dunk practice. I always knew uh, anime, Goku and Rock Lee uh, weighted cloth, cloth right. training was rooted in deep science or is it deep science rooted in anime? Aha, the ultimate question. Mm -hmm. Chicken. Or the um, egg, right? I like when Piccolo would take off his armor and it would like break a rock. Like, yeah, people would be like, whatever, and he'd drop it and be like, crunch, and everyone would be like, oh, shit, what? Okay. That's how I felt taking the weighted vest off at the end of the day, just like, oh, so much lighter. It's tempting. I might have to start using a weighted vest. <laughs> um, could I go do jiu-jitsu in a weighted vest? That'll be real confusing. Oh, it'd be awful. It'd be so awful. People yeah. would get you stacked up, and you could just never recover because all the weight's uh, like, oh, Number six, is strength sufficiently realized in a three rep range versus twos versus ones lifting submaximally with juggernaut method? Outside of powerlifting in the context of jumping, is there any benefit to actually going heavy for a week or two? Does this create more ability, generate more force for jumping? This is difficult to communicate. I know exactly what you're asking, by the way. Essentially, where's the best, um, where's strength best expressed and realized for sports athleticism? If strength is expressed in a five reps, then furthermore in three reps, then why would an aqua heavier? Well, so uh, strength that is explosively transferred to jumping and things like that is probably best tooled up in a three rep range. And remember, not three RM, but three rep range, heavy sets of three that are also very fast moving. Going into twos and ones probably reaches into the heavy and slows your velocity. It makes the movement less specific, probably doesn't generate any higher amount of uh, force per repetition. It just lowers the velocity. Um, so I would say that threes are about as good as it gets for sport transfer. When James and I were sport coaches, uh, strength and conditioning coaches, we would uh, sometimes practice, uh, you know, let's say uh, colleagues of ours would, would uh, go down to twos mm -hmm. in a power block. We almost never would. We would just stop at threes because like, you know, might as well do two sets of three than three sets of two and just get the fuck out of the gym faster and go play rugby. Um, so singles is, I've never programmed singles for any sport athletes ever. Um, and I think they're a gigantic fucking waste of time. And that's that. James. Well, yeah. And they're a waste of time because the risk to reward is so shitty. It's shitty from a physical standpoint. Cause every time you get closer to the two and to the one mark, the absolute load on the bar is actually destroying you more and more and more. And that's when you typically see, like, even when we got to threes, we would very commonly start to see people getting injured, not injured in like the sense like they were doing something horrible or, you know, uh, outrageous, but just the heaviness of the load tends to bring out injuries or yeah. exacerbate old injuries. Yeah. Like, like well, my knee kind of hurt on that one. Exactly. You just yeah, hear exactly. that from a jump athlete. And so like going heavier than threes is just like in terms of like the amount of psychological preparation that you need to do those lifts in terms of the amount of physical strain and like the, the, uh, the uh, SRA curve of doing those types of lifts, man, it's just so shitty in terms of SFR. So I think Mike nailed it. Like threes is really good. You get virtually the same fitness payout, uh, significantly less fatigue. And like you can modulate the force velocity characteristics a little bit better. The other thing too is like, how often in sports do you truly make a maximal dynamic effort in terms of like slow moving high force output? Really the only thing one I can think of is rugby and that's when you do the scrum, but even that's not done maximally because you have to play for 80 minutes. 
So it's always, yeah. it's a high force, real slow moving thing, but it's never truly a maximal effort because of self-preservation and pacing strategy. So it's it almost never happens. Don't cover. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Number seven, I have a friend who is an engineer who works for a consulting firm. He creates robotics, surgical instrumentation, is able to code as a personal business building drones. He and I have been chatting about how to make vertical jump training smarter using force plates, et cetera. He is willing to build uh, me to help me on the jumping journey. He has access to 3D printers, steel cutting materials, all types of sensors. Would love your creative slash out of the box thinking on what, if anything, you'd ask him to build to what end, some ideas. I can use some type of sensor technology to ma measure standing vert. I use it to auto-regulate jumps, perhaps, when power goes down in a significant way stop uh, activity for a set or day, et cetera. Identify where along the force velocity curve I am, which could help optimize training closer to peaking. I'm going to give you my opinion, and then James can give you his. My opinion on all that shit is fucking dollar chip. doesn't do anything. Uh, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the intel you ever need about your, how your power training is going is, is like, a, like, a, like a vertex, like literally just like a high can you reach. For your dunking specifically, that's very instructive because it's a, it's a jump reach test, which is exactly what a dunk is. So if you get a Vertec, I don't even know how much they cost, like $100, you get the fucking just the pipe with fucking little things and you can touch and jump. If you use that several times a week to uh, either modulate how high you're jumping, like do reps to a certain height and hit the height every time, or do maximum jumping and track yourself that way, I think that uh, anything else is just almost pointless to have because if you, if you, so, so for, so for example, identify where along the first velocity curve I am, you already know that by how strong you are and how you can jump, uh, auto-regulate jumps, perhaps when power goes down, how do you know when power goes down? Cause your vertex numbers go down and you know your body weight. So you can calculate power using an online calculator, um, sensor technology to measure standing vert. Guess what else measure standing vert more specifically a vertex, which actually incorporates where your hand goes to. So it's one of these things. And uh, James might have a different opinion than this, but he might go on his, uh, he likes to go on a mini rant, of uh, collecting more data and technology than you need to get the job done. It's cool and all, but uh, sometimes the, you know, you know, we got uh, 80 years of, of engineering and barbells still look like barbells because they really work so well. So it's one of those that maybe it's just uh, having built you a drone that does uh, auto programmed 360 uh, around you. And then when you jump at 360 cameras, you so you have the most baller dunk video of all time. Say, put, a, put a GoPro on that drone. That's what, that's what you got to do. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I tend to agree with Mike on this one. So there's really nothing there that like, um, there's also like a lot of really easy, readily available stuff. Like a just jump mat costs like, I think like 200 or 300 bucks. I mean, that's great. It's basically a force plate that you can like, that's commercial. Uh, readily available jumping force plate. It's not very expensive. Uh, so there's that. You can get the push band, which is something that can get you a lot of data for jumping velocity, power output. You can get, there's another one called, uh, I think it's called the beast sensor, which is like a little Bluetooth magnet you can put on stuff. It does the same thing that the push band does. It's just an accelerometer. Um, ah, man, you don't really don't need, you don't need to build a force plate just for like a dunk thing. Like, how do you know if you're getting better? Like, are you closer to dunking? Okay, like, good. I've, I saw your pictures. I know that you have documented your hand height on the fucking basketball hoop. What more do you need than that? Which is, was a really cool uh, Instagram post, by the way. You can see his hand like getting higher and higher and higher. Um, That's it. The thing with auto-regulating jumps is this is where you run into a problem where you can have measurement devices that look at your jump height or the velocity of your jump. And really, the auto-regulation portion comes into situations where it only tells you not to jump, right? So you, you do a jump, <laughs> right. it, it, you, you do a jump, and it's like, I can't produce that much power or speed today. So like, what's the answer? It's like, okay, well, don't do your jump training today because you are not in a good state of preparedness to train for jumping, right? You can't generate an overload because you're so, you're like below 80% of your best in these parameters, right? So, okay, that's great. But then it doesn't tell you what to do later, right? It, it only will just reaffirm like either today's a good jumping day, or maybe we shouldn't be jumping today. That's kind of the problem. So you can do that. Man, I just don't think it's like a, a really great use of your time. That's all. Yeah. It's not it's like, okay, now what? Do I jump tomorrow? I don't know. When am I going to be ready? Like, mm, I don't know. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Man with one of the greatest names ever. Oh, this name is real, by the way. Zach Drawl. I was thinking Drawl. Like, oh, you're so Drawl, Michael. <laughs> well, Zach's name is a nickname for Anadrol, <laughs> which is a hell of an anabolic. It can, I, I want Zach to do like a USAW meet and like the people are like picking people to drug like, test. You're getting tested. Like, Zach, we're all getting in line. Like, God damn it. <laughs> um, all right. He says, how do you, I recently had to switch to AM training to facilitate a new business, but also two oxidase training on a few days. 
I wake an hour and a half before training and instantly eat a meal focused on carbs and protein. And then on the way to the gym, I also have my fun snack for the day, usually sour candy. My performance is the same in the AM as it was in the PM with the caveat that I have not gotten sore in the way I usually do for my auto regular. I do for my auto-regulated volume jumps, thoughts, total sleep doesn't change. I have no idea. There could be tons of other variables. Um, yeah, it would be If your performance is good, man, I wouldn't worry about soreness too much. Yeah, and I wonder too if it's related to like when you ate your meals. Like if you tend to be like a heavy eater in the evening because that's when you would train and get home from work and then you'd be like, okay, now I have like, you know, I still got 300 grams of carbs to get down by the end of the day. That might be kind of influencing that where it's like now you train in the morning and maybe your eating habits are still similar and you might just be little off schedule in terms of like your timing stuff. Although I really don't think that's a big deal either. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just spitballing ideas. Yeah. I have no clue. Yeah. Also in regards to James stance on firearms per our conversation last time as a lifelong CCL and competitive shooter, that's really sweet. Um, I also recommend practicing with your carry weapon as if it were martial art. Oh, like fuck. Yeah. Stance. Completely agree. Completely agree. And for those of you, I know, I know this is like a contentious topic for people. So I, I understand if you, if you, don't agree with but i i agree with that position where you, you take it very seriously and there's some cool organizations like idpa is a, an organization where you can do like testing uh practice stuff and have like kind of they do little like kind of little scenarios that you can compete in there's all sorts of really cool stuff so i mean like being a firearms owner is a really big deal and if you're not willing to take the responsibility to practice and be proficient then it's not worth your time same thing like with jujitsu like you don't take one jujitsu match and think that you can go and choke somebody out necessarily there's a very real possibility that you could kill somebody trying to do that and so i think people who train understand that risk knowing that like okay you know i thought it was just like a little bit of <laughs> this kind of stuff but then you realize like when you're training getting into a fight and getting into a, a self-defense situation is some serious business and you want to make sure that you know what you're doing yeah Charles Vicker says, hey, docs, hope you're well today. A couple of questions for you. Number one, I'm about to start nursing school. From talking to older, more experienced nurses, I've been told that since I'm relatively tall and fit looking dude, I'm very likely to get assigned more than my fair share of very large patients to care for. I can almost <laughs> certainly tell you that's the case. <laughs> that's my wife profiling. Is, what? Yeah, my, my wife is a doctor. She's neither uh, – she's she's tall and, well, she looks jacked. So, But, but – she's tiny, but she's super thick and jacked. So they asked her to move people all the time, but she's like, okay, I guess I'm doing this. Um, I've been told this may take a toll on my back. Yeah, but you've been told this by weak people. So uh, don't <laughs> remember that. So I wanted to see if you guys had any ideas on ways I could tweak my training to optimally prepare for this. It'll be two years before I'm out of school and working. So I have plenty of time to train. I currently do the following exercise for my back. Barbell bent over rows, pull-ups, chin-ups, chest support or rows, neutral grip, lat pull-down, sumo DLs, RDLs. I do sumo RDLs. Uh, my leg days, uh, so I end up with four times a week frequency. My back on my especially my upper back on my seems rather high. So remember, your upper back has very little to do with you picking people up. It's mostly hamstring, glute, and erector strength, and actually some bicep strength. Um, I do body weight, free weight exercises, 510 rep range, and machine exercises in the 10 20 rep range. How would you recommend altering my back training to target the goal of being able to bear uh, part of all the weight, very large people, and minimize my risk for injury? Obviously, I don't expect you to construct an entire training program for me, but some pointers would be appreciated, I think. It may behoove me to add in some heavy holds and carries along with perhaps back extensions. Don't do it. So here's the deal. You can get deadlift. Job. Yeah. If you can deadlift an RDL a trillion pounds, you can go and pick up a real person that's that heavy. Uh, and certainly remember, they're never going to ask you to do anything a human being can't do. So like if, if someone from like 600 pounds, you know, that takes like eight people to move from one bed to another. You're not going to be doing a shit by yourself. You're always at work. Just say, hey, guys, I, I can't pick this person up. Like, can I get some help here? Listen, the, the entire hospital system, the entire sort of ethics um, situation in hospital systems is like if you need help, people show up to help you. There are always other nurses and doctors. So one big piece of advice I can tell you is don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't get a ton of pride and don't be like, yeah, I can do everything myself. Cause if you demonstrate yourself to be willing to lift 200 pound people by yourself into beds, they're just going to give you more 200 pound people to lift. Um, but don't fuck yourself over like that. Ask somebody to help you and then you'll bear it with two people. And they'll always be thankful that you're helping out. You may be more often asked to help out, but don't, use your physical strength a ton to be the sole proprietor of physical strength. There's tons of people around. Do your fair share. Do more than your fair share, but don't fucking Superman the shit and just try to do it all by yourself. First of all. Second of all, if you can deadlift a ton and bent row a ton, you're well on your way. I would add relatively heavy curls into the mix. And if you are in any capacity of access, strong equipment, specifically 
uh, loading implements, stones, bags are really good. Uh, odd objects, I would uh, work on high loading and low loading and work on heavy loading. And then once you've loaded, you know, a 250 pound stone, man, regular people just don't fucking weigh that much. Uh, so I would uh, do some of that if I could. But if not, heavy stiff legged deadlifts, heavy regular deadlifts, heavy barbell butt rows, and uh, heavy dumbbell and barbell curls in the 5% rep range, controlled, of course. Um, and you'll be well on your way to having all the strength you need. Yeah. So I think like, I, I agree with what Mike said. I think my, what I would recommend is just focus on the barbells, like your normal training stuff for now, because you're going to get basically that training stimulus while you're at work. It's one of those things yeah. that's like, you might not have to train it very much at all because you're going to be doing it. So you could also learn how to operate like a medical forklift. That'd be pretty cool. Right. Just like sweet, pick, pick somebody up. Um, no, but just kidding. But the, yeah, I think like just focusing on getting strong and all the compound movements is something that you people tend to do anyway, like keep doing that. And then it, it just becomes a matter of auto regulating your back training from that point on. Like if you have a particularly rough night yeah. at the office and uh, then you got to go train the next day and you're like, fuck, I can't, I'm not doing deadlifts today. Then don't, you know what? Take a light day, move on, do something else, find a workaround, maybe do some hamstring curls or some 45 degree back raise, something to get something and go on and move on to the next one. You know what I mean? So I think auto regulation really is going to be the key at that point. Um, and just keep doing what you're currently doing and what your, your training seems to be fine to me. So. Structure and flexibility. The RP Diet app builds a structure of eating that creates the results you're looking for, but has the flexibility to let you scan your favorite foods and follow your preferred diet philosophy. The digital diet coach in your pocket is more powerful than ever, so let's build a better you with the RP Diet app. Um, all right. Along the lines of question one, I've been told that the same traits that make me likely to end up carrying very large patients also increase the chances I'll end up carrying hot. For hostile and aggressive patients, such as people who come to the ER intoxicated. Super. I did a few years of judo back in high school, but that was well over a decade ago, and I'm quite rusty. I did a bit of research, and it seems like BJJ day is probably one of the better choices for martial art to learn to minimize my chance of being seriously injured if I get tackled by someone who's high on meth, correct me if I'm wrong. It's actually the best martial art to learn that, because jiu-jitsu, tons of it starts on your back anyway. Um, there are about a two dozen BJJ gyms within 20 minute driving distance of me. What do you think I should look for when it comes to picking out a good one? Well, you might like BJJ for a ton of other reasons rather than just working with patients. Um, so I'd pick a school in which uh, the instructor is not a cocksucker. Uh, the training partners are cool people. So you might go to a couple schools and see if you fit in. Uh, and also one in which a lot of the people compete. And uh, one of the ways you can tell is they sign up for competitions. And another way is more ranked belts. So like purple, brown, black. And then you also tell if people have a bunch of tape on their hands, that's usually a good sign that they're in real serious shit. Um, you don't want to go to a jiu-jitsu gym and learn like some wussified version of the sport, which is relatively rare, but can still occur. And you want a lot of good people to train again. I will tell you right now, a huge, huge, huge thing that you need to keep in mind when you're engaging physically with patients, it doesn't really matter if they started it and it doesn't matter how nuts they are. You cannot exert almost any offense, and the way you exert defense has to be incredibly measured because you can get straight fired forever from the medical profession by laying a single fucking hand on a patient, even if they started at first. Usually, you just secure yourself. You probably don't even secure them, and you call security. It's security's job to do yes. that kind of shit, not yours. Yes. So the, the, the one thing you could do is say a meth addict tackles you. You can loop him into closed guard, pull his head down, head and arm down into you, and yell for security. And when they come and get him, you let him go. Okay. You don't even want to sweep him and get on top. You get on top. That's all security camera. You just executed a martial arts move on a man. And was, his heart could explode. He's in fucking meth. And all of a sudden you kill the guy, quote unquote. And then you're, you're going to be in a situation you don't want to be in. Jiu-Jitsu is the best art for playing like a victim, but you're really not. You're really in full control. So I would definitely do jujitsu. It'd be sweet if you do kickboxing. Someone fucks with you, you just tape them into a fucking yeah, like a, a that'll, computer. That'll be great for your career, I'm sure. <laughs> for sure. Uh, so uh, James, any anything uh, to add there? I would just say like I. It, I, I know several, um, you know, obviously Mike's wife is a doctor. I've had like plenty of family members who are nurses. We have close friends who are nurses and we actually have a, a close friend who's a nurse who's also a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And the yeah. thing is, it's like, it's very rare if seldom that you even ever make any type of hostile contact with the patient. It's almost always an issue where you call security and there's probably multiple people. I mean, like it's very rare something like there's a situation that goes unnoticed for more than like a minute, right? Or even I'd say less than that where other people yeah. start getting involved. So really like going back to what Dr. Mike was saying, more often than not, you're going to maybe find yourself in a situation where you might just be bear hugging a guy. Just Yeah, just, positional control. Right, positional control. Exactly. You're not really thinking about like, okay, I'm going to, 
we're going to go down. I'm going to, I'm going to sweep and then move to mount. And then I'm going to, you know, it's like, that's just not going to happen. Somebody else is going to jump in there. Security's going to get involved. Like it's very, I would say probably a very rare scenario where you're going to move into like full combat scenario. So yeah. The only reason I bring this up is because if you're thinking about taking martial arts for this explicit purpose, I don't think it's a good use of your time. If you want to learn how to do jujitsu for your own enjoyment and your own betterment for other reasons, maybe a little bit of this included, I totally support that. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I think like if you're doing this, you're like, oh, I need to, I need this skill for my job. No, you don't. You'll probably be okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do know uh, one really good sneaky, sneaky knee bar from bottom. Uh, <laughs> So if your meth head is really wailing on you and you're like, man, no one's going to notice this. You can straight jack his shit up. <laughs> like, all right, you just earned yourself an MRI now too. And so now we got to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If he's on meth, he probably wouldn't even notice until he tried to walk and just his leg broke under him and he'd be like, shit. And then you could be like, oh, you know, I didn't do anything. <laughs> what do I know? Yeah. Um, all right. Number three, at what point should a beginner lifter start considering taking an active rest phase? I have a really great answer for this, actually. I'm coming up on one year of consistent structured resistance training. I find to get some minor aches and pains in my joints while lifting, mostly elbows, hips, and knees after six weeks of actively progressing. When that happens, I take a one-week view. Kind of but that's that's, that's a lot. Afterwards. You get it in your elbows, hips, and knees after six weeks? Like, yikes. But he does say that it goes away completely after a deload, which is really good. That's good. Um, is there any reason for me to consider taking active rest maintenance phase, or would it be smart to just keep doing what I'm doing until it stops working? I assume that later is probably a better option. The latter is probably a better option, but I wanted to find some confirmation. My advice would be twofold. One, I think a two-week active rest is something someone can do every year of their training, and it'll only make you better and never make you worse. So I would just start programming that active rest every year. Sometimes you might need more active rest than that, and that's on a need a needs basis, right? If you do a six-month crazy training cycle, super competitive, and then you're like, I literally could just die in place, and then it's like, oh, like you're four weeks or four days into your deload, and you feel like you're still super fucked up. Yeah, it's time for an active rest, right? And you'll you'll know when that, that is. But I honestly, I would just take – this is something like I, – I, I don't like to get dogmatic. I don't like to be particular. It's all relative. But I, I will say that a very good piece of sort of real-world simple advice is every year, I think every one, uh, minus some very strange cases, should take one extra week of active rest after. So you, you do the last deload of your macro cycle, and then you just take one week either completely off of weights and just be active – or just completely off of everything and just watch Netflix for a week. I think that does some really, really, really awesome things to you. And it has zero fucking downside on the net balance, like literally zero. You're not going to miss any muscle gain. You're not going to do anything. You're going to say you're going to crush fatigue so much that it's going to be only ever good for you. So. Yeah. And you know, a great time to think about that is like when you take uh, vacations or trips, stuff like that, that's a yep. really easy, perfect time to integrate that. Uh, I think the big, so aside from just saying like, okay, I have like one to two weeks, every year that I'm going to take. And that's like part of my normal plan. I think after that, really a good determinant of when you need active rest is what's going on up here. So if you are showing yes. up to the gym and you're just like the thought of doing squats or thought of like trying to do this deadlift or anything is like making you sick, anxious, or you're just dreading it. It's causing you like anxiety. That's a really great time to take active rest. If you never get there, just keep doing what you're doing. And like, so there's nothing saying that you have to take active rest. Like if you don't necessarily need it, it's probably a good idea to take some, like Mike already said throughout the year, but that doesn't, that's like one to two weeks a year. That's represents a very small amount of time. Like if you don't really need to take the extra rest for your mind or your body to heal, keep doing what you're doing until yeah. it becomes a problem. 100%. Khalid B says, hello doctors, a few questions for you. Number one, following up on last week's question where I mentioned I kept one rating consistently throughout the mental cycle. Okay, I kept rating one because it's the other mouse cycle on the male physique template. I did so because I wanted to ensure that each microcycle is overloading. Uh, Khalid, don't do that. Khalid, goddammit, don't do that. Yes. Microcycles are overloading even if you reduce the volume, if another variable goes up. Even if you reduce the volume and another variable does not go up, the overload is a range. It is not a point. You're still very well within the range. You can do a mass cycle of eight sets or a microcycle of eight sets, then six sets and four sets. And if your MEV is two sets, you're overloading every single time, even though it's declining because that's not optimal, but it's way, way good enough. So when you do things that you want to ensure that each microcycle goes, or is overloading, I 100% hear you, but you got to think about fatigue as well. Overload is never a training principle by itself. 
Yeah. And so this is like a common mistake and something that I think we've been trying to address lately. So it's worth repeating, you know, something is overloading in the context of the combination of the volumes, intensities and frequencies at which it's trained. It's not one of those things, right? It's all of them kind of put together. So it's, uh, it's very hard to really fall out of an overloading range so long as you are not just doing like really easy maintenance volume active rest style training, right? So it doesn't have to be like a linear increase in any one of those things, right? The combination of the volume, which is the sets and reps that you're doing or the duration, the intensities, both the absolute and relative intensities and the frequency, whether it's per day, per week, per mesocycle, whatever, all of those things contribute to generating an overload over time. And it operates on a very large spectrum of achievable overloads. Yep. He says, I did so because I wanted to ensure that each microcycle is overloading during doing more volume in the last session, hence progressive overload. Um, because sometimes if I kept the same sets, I ended up with doing the same weights for the same reps for two straight sessions. That is still overload, by That's the way. That's okay, yeah. Would you say that uh, this approach, rating one consistently through the men's cycle while keeping performance relatively seem as effective? Maybe, maybe not. And here's why not. If you're radically sore that entire time, because you're always adding volume, you may have an entire mass cycle where you grow zero muscle because you're just healing damage. And if you don't rate one all the time, if you rate honestly based on your soreness and performance, then you wouldn't have that problem. So I could be effective, but there's no guarantee. If you rate honestly, there's pretty much a guarantee it will be effective. Yeah, I agree. Number two, tying this back to question one, how will performance be typically affected as volume rises? Is it expected rep strength remain relatively the same as volume rises throughout the mass cycle? For example, in week one of my cycle, my first set of incline bench was at 12 reps of three RIR. It was for two sets total. By week five, I did five sets of incline bench for that session with the first one of 13 reps of two RIR. Um, uh, what's the load there? We have to know the load. I can't tell you about the performance if the load's not included. If I kept the sets the same at two or even three by week five, I'm sure my rep strength would go up. But since volume is the main driver of hypertrophy, is it fine to keep increasing the volume while maintaining rep strength? It is absolutely fine to keep increasing volume while maintaining rep strength. That's probably the way you grow the most muscle. It's also fine if your performance goes up a little bit. You just don't want to be having performance skyrocket while you know you're literally just dropping fatigue because <laughs> you could just be doing more volume and growing. But the huge thing is the number one rating on the MPT is an integrative rating of both performance and soreness. If you're super fucking sore, and you mentioned earlier you were super fucked up overlapping sore as far as I can remember, then it is not fine to continue to increase volume while maintaining rep strength because rep strength can be coming from purely neurological adaptations while you gain zero muscle. So make sure you're rating honestly. Don't do feed forward ratings. Do feedback ratings. Auto regulation is the way to rate that. So don't say, okay, I need an overload next week, so I should do more. No. How did you respond? Was your soreness healed relatively quickly? Yes. Or is your performance still normal? Yes. Then you go up. But if your soreness is super fucked up, but your performance is fine, don't be like, well, I should go up anyway. No, don't, because you'll be so sore, you won't be having a chance to make any adaptations. You'll just uh, be healing damage, James. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So I, I, I appreciate your thought process in like trying to maintain a progressive overload, but just keep in mind that does not necessarily mean it has to tangibly go up in one of those metrics every single time. It very well just might maintain for a couple of weeks in a row and then maybe goes up a little bit in volume or goes up a little bit in relative intensity or absolute intensity. That is perfectly fine. So don't just, just keep pushing forward because you think you're doing something wrong by not increasing week to week. Yep. Number three for mass cycle to mass cycle is the goal to keep volume trending upwards. Meaning I say I did a total of 100 thrift sets in the last week of mass cycle one in the next mass cycle profitable growth. Should I aim to at least match the number of sets of mass one? Uh, if I did, let's say 120, but the weight is a bit higher, would that be uh, hyper hypotrophic? It could be hypotrophic. Uh, yeah. Would that be hypertrophic? Um, the goal is absolutely not to increase sets from meso to meso to meso. As you get stronger, you may actually have to decrease sets. We're going to say it's a huge, huge statement. Volume for hypertrophy should almost everywhere be autoregulatory in nature. You do what you need and what your body can recover from not a feed forward goal. By the way, the same is true for weight on the bar. When people are like, I'm going to squat 315 for 10, then my legs will be big. It's nice to keep in the back of your head to keep yourself honest that you're trying, <laughs> but how much you squat today and tomorrow and the day after, uh, and then this week, next week, week after, it depends on what your RIRs are. Like if you squat a 300 with an RIR of four, and the next week you squat 305 for the same reps with an RIR of six, you're like, fuck, I got way stronger. I need to go to 315 to get an IR of it. Great. 
But if you're pushing and altering your technique and your RIRs are super fucking low just to get some arbitrary numbers, there's no amount of willpower. You don't get strong by willpower. You get stronger by mechanical alterations and cellular alterations, which just express themselves with hard training. So as long as you're training hard, auto regulation should take care of all the rest of that stuff. Volume is no exception. Yeah. So I think when you're just looking at it at sets alone, it's easy to say like, no, you don't want to think about that, doing it that way. If you're looking at something like sets and reps, like a kind of a volume load kind of proxy, what you might find across mesocycles is something like this, where they kind of overlap quite a bit and maybe start to spread out. That's more of a product of maybe just using higher rep ranges to conserve uh, like fatigue and stuff later on. Right. So you might be like, okay, here's my six to 10 meso here's my like 10 to 20 meso. It's like, yeah, they're pretty close. Maybe the 10 to 20 one starts a little bit higher, maybe ends a little bit higher, but they're mostly overlapping. And really that's just a product of doing more reps, right? The thing is what the strategy that you're trying to adopt in terms of just moving the, vo the volume upward is great once you figure out what your MRV is, right? So that strategy is the right idea to figure out your MRV. But once you figure that out, then it becomes an issue of auto-regulation over time, like Mike said. So I think for somebody who's maybe a more novice or early intermediate, you do generally want to try and push the volume up. But the purpose of doing that is not to be more hyper hypertrophic per se. It's to figure out where your MRV is and then yeah. training within the MEV to MRV. That's the idea. Yeah. And once you figure out your MRV, pushing any further than that will be stupid. And the whole point of figuring out your MRV is to learn when that becomes stupid. <laughs> it's a very clear time when it does. Yeah. Number four, uh, Khalid's last question. Uh, these are great questions, by the way, Khalid. Um, on the last week of a mesocycle, aside from compound movements, can I go to failure and all other exercises for all sense and that's what sense sets and I will, since I will be deloading the week after. Ah, yeah, absolutely. That'd be rough though. Cause if you do it for all sets, the problem is, is like, can you actually get as a good hypertrophic stimulus in terms of like uh, yeah. the rest of the session though? Right. So it's like, if for, for me, at least like if I went to failure first set of squats, I'm like done. <laughs> the rest of the day. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I, I would say that to get through your volume as a hypertrophy trainee, what you should do is go to failure, but without a shitload of psychological arousal. Yeah. And then the next day, you should also go to failure with a little bit more psychological arousal. Towards the end of your workouts, you should be screaming and yelling in your last week, but make sure that you don't do so much of that, that you toast yourself to the point where you can't even do your last half of the week. So if I would say go to RIR, one RIR, and then see how you feel. And then next month cycle, yeah. go one RIR, some zero RIR, see how you feel. And then eventually, if you handle zero RIR for everything well, rock out. Just don't like you're stopping at one RIR, two RIR, and then go zero, cycle RIR, everything. And then halfway through your last week, you can't even come back to work. So Yeah. And if you're not really training at zero RIR a lot, what you might do is kind of a couple preparatory ones where like you pick the last set on each exercise, you go to zero RIR and see how that goes. Right. And see, play around with it and see like, okay, well, I went to zero on the last set and that meant the first four sets I did were great. And then the last one was like really fucking hard. But then I noticed when I got to my second quad exercise or my second chest exercise, I was completely done and I wasn't able to match reps and all these other things. And it really kind of fell apart. So I know, okay, for that movement, maybe going to zero RIR wasn't great, but if I do it on some of these other ones, which I've just trialed and errored a little bit, it doesn't seem to be as negative of an impact, right? So play around with it, see how it goes. I would say start by doing the last sets, feeling out those, and then you can always think about moving up to the middle or front sets later on as you get more experience with it. Yep. Okay. So this next question from Mike Rossi is an, Excellent, excellent question, and it's illustrating a really, really, really important point. Um, I hope folks listen to this answer because it's something that's commonly asked by more advanced uh, thinking folks, and it has a very, very clear answer that I don't think James and I have ever articulated. A in We've articulated parts of it for sure many times, but James and I are going to try to really sort of knock this one out of the park for you guys in a very simple manner so that you know what's going on, because it is quite a mystery, right? I'm getting so much anticipate, anticipation. I, I know, like, I know, I know. He's like, how big are your cocks? Um, like, all right, well, hold on. No. Hold on, let me jack <laughs> off. Um, okay, uh, Mike Rossi says, hey, docs, I'm a new RP Plus subscriber. Do oh, call on. I, I have to do this, James, because you and I are best friends, and we just have to do stupid shit like this. Can, um, can you imagine if, like, you know, like, you were, like, tindering girls, like, hey, send me your dick pic, and you just didn't know that you were supposed to get hard before, and you send her, like, a totally flaccid pic? Just and she's totally like, flaccid, like, oh. out, of, out of the pool, like, yeah. turtled up, everything. She, just She's like, you're like, what do you think? And she's like, wow, I thought you said you were, like, like normal size. And you're like, yeah, I mean, like, that's how dicks look. And she's like, are you hard? You'd be like, no, why the fuck would I send you a heart pick? You're like, I mean, this why is wouldn't you? You're like, normal pool size. Like it's like a Seinfeld episode where George gets caught naked. Right. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's what you're going to get most times, right? It's, <laughs> it's on you to make it hard. God damn. Yeah. 
Anyway. Yeah, dick pics is a, a complicated issue. Very complicated. All right. I'm glad I'm married now. I don't. Well, you're married too. Uh, I'm glad we're married. We don't have to, we don't have to deal <laughs> right. with that anymore. That's right. Ooh. <laughs> um, uh, luckily, okay, this is the last aside I'll make. <laughs> <laughs> last point on dick pics. <laughs> when I was doing hookups and sending dick pics, uh, which I never sent unrequested, by the way, I only ever requested. Um, I, I'm, I'm just glad I wasn't like a fitness celebrity back then. Because like, bro, if I was on the dating scene now, holy fuck. <laughs> Like there's my shit will end up on Instagram immediately. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> there yeah. it is. Or Twitter. Um, Twitter. That's right. Mike Rossi says, Hey docs, I'm a new RP plus subscriber. Look forward to a Q and A's every week. Thanks in advance. I'm interested in refining how I evaluate volume progression for exercises done the later in a long workout. I use the volume algorithm to determine set additions based on previous week's performance slash shortness. And I feel I have a solid understanding of my MEVs and MRVs for several muscle cycles. However, I feel there is too much noise when tracking progression and exercises done later in a workout because so much intercession fatigue has been accumulated mm. from the compound movements done earlier in the workout, especially when I've added load and or sets to those movements and I'm pushing them closer to failure the previous week. By the final week of a meso, it's often difficult to maintain performance on the exercises later due to the additional intercession fatigue, even if I'm more recovered and coming into a workout. As a result, I'm left unsure whether I'm actually hitting my MRV for certain muscle groups, such as triceps and side delts in this example, or I'm instead entering junk volume territory due to the total volume for a single session. Do you have any alternatives to addressing this concern other than splitting the workout into two separate AM and PM sessions? So first point, that is absolutely the best way to do it, but not everyone can do it, okay? Because uh, with a certain length of workout, we're just going to get shitty towards the end. It just has yep. to, right? Um, or is it a legitimate concern at all? It is, and we'll it get is. to how it's resolved. Maybe the very fact that so much additional volume has been done coming into these later sessions in, ensures overload in and of itself, and if I'm able to maintain the previous week's performance, uh, in many cases, that is absolutely the case. So basically what we're saying is like systemic fatigue has gone up before I even do these muscle groups. If I can match with that elevated fatigue, certainly performance underlying is good. That is actually true. I'm willing to break up the workout into two sessions, but I want to first determine if it's more optimal in any meaningful sense. I'm hesitant to reduce the total volume uh, I add in order to preserve myself for exercises later in the workout uh, because I do feel that adding sets where I did was necessary to guarantee oral. Well, yeah, don't do that for sure. You don't want to be like, oh, I would squat for four sets, but I should squat for three because then I won't be able to do my dildo curls later, right, which right. comes like in my seventh exercise. And you don't really much care about that day. And that's a big hint as to the real answer here. I provided my week three and week four performances with my current week four month cycle for more context, but feel free to ignore it if you're more comfortable addressing the question more generally. We are. Uh, you'll see that my performance dropped off on the two tricep movements and was roughly maintained on the side delt movement. So real quick, uh, uh, go ahead. Just for formatting stuff, guys, I, I can appreciate when you want to post like specific workout stuff in this, uh, but in the forum, like it comes out so shitty when I try to like do this. So just do me a favor. And if, when you post stuff like this, don't like tab it out really crazy. Cause then it just means I have to like untab it out later. So just keep them as simple as you can just for future. Cool. I, I don't, we don't mind seeing this kind of stuff, but sometimes it's a pain in the ass in the forum. So that's all. Yeah. Okay. Here is the answer to how to deal with this because this is something everyone deals with. When you have longer workouts, the latter half, the latter third, especially of workouts, tend to suffer from this problem of you basically would have to essentially say, okay, I'm reaching MRV because I'm, I'm, I can't possibly match performance. Clearly my triceps or whatever I'm doing last are overreached. What are they? The answer is they might not be. And here's why. Your intra-session MRV might have been exceeded before your weekly MRV has. That's a big deal because intercession MRV, we don't so much care about a ton. It doesn't, you know, yeah, you go over a ton, you just have higher, lower quality training. But because you've put a muscle group at the tail end of a workout, you've already accepted lower quality training. You're trying to do easier training. So point number one is make sure you're not doing four muscle groups in one day and you're pushing all of them super hard. That's fucking stupid because it's basically impossible. So the last muscle groups, you should be the ones that you're less prioritizing and thus don't super care about losing performance on and don't super care about progressing in volume a ton. But how do you answer the question, uh, it, it, given that your triceps, let's say are fifth exercise and given that they're stalling in performance or lagging, how do you know if they're over their MRV or if it's just systemic fatigue? There's a very good way to tell. When you do your triceps later in the week, another time in the week, and they're early, are they suffering in performance? You basically have exercises that are early for a muscle group, fresh, other parts of your week and some other parts, they're not fresh. The fresh ones are your canaries in the coal mine for MRV. Because if your triceps suck fresh, your MRV is fucked. 
if your triceps are amazing fresh, but after 16 sets of chest and back, they suck, they're fine. Uh, but you're just not going to get the greatest training in the world from triceps, nor should you be trying. Like, I can understand a four sets of cable pushdown, superset to pushups at the end of a big day of everything else. But, you know, don't do a whole tricep workout at the end of a whole chest and back and leg workout because it's, it's, it's going to be dog shit anyway. Yeah. So you want to know, uh, you want to have times when your triceps get trained early. So for example, like in my training, we have a chest tricep day and another push day. Uh, we have three days, but uh, the other one's super easy. So I'll just get rid of that one. We have a chest tricep day and we have a tricep chest day. So how do we know our chest uh, and when chest stuff is second in the day, how do we know if we hit our chest MRV? We don't, but we have that first chest day to tell us. And remember, when you exceed your MRV, it's on a weekly basis. You'll know when you're fucked up. Um, so a lot of exercises, you know, sometimes um, I travel a lot and I use different leg press and different hack squat machines. So who the fuck knows what my MRV is? But I always barbell squat. And barbell squats are always the same. When my barbell squat starts to tank, I know for sure. It doesn't fucking matter if I hit a PR on some dildo leg press machine. It might just be the machine. So you want... Or most cases to have muscles trained fresh. Okay. You want them trained fresh, at least sometimes or fresher first, second. And then you want to maintain, really maintain your eyes on those. And if those performances are good, you're fine. No matter how dog shit your performances on the, on the workouts in which they're last, if those go down, doesn't matter how good your performance is on the other workouts, you're, you're really in a really bad place. And you can respond with the following. You can say, well, look, sometimes my mental cycles is not prioritizing these certain muscles and they're never on the front burner. They're never one or two. They're always in the back. Well, then you should be training close to MV or MEV anyway. And you don't give a shit about your MRV because you'll never hit it for those muscle groups. So if you're going MEV to MRV in any muscles, at some points in the week, they should be up in the uh, first couple of exercises. Those are the ones you look at. The ones that you're programming later, just keep them to a real minimal amount. Don't worry about the progression. Just try hard, get closer to failure and you'll do a good job. James? Yeah, that was really good. I'm, uh, I'm just reading through some of his examples. And I had a couple points here. So the first is like, yeah, like your JM press, you know, in terms of like RIR and some of the reps went down. I honestly would, I mean, like on paper, because the reps are similar uh, and they're done at a lower RIR, like, yeah, it's, you know, you could call that a performance decrease. But I mean, it's so close. The tricep press down one is a little... Um, more evident in terms of reps, but even then, like it's still pretty close. I mean, the first two sets, clearly there's a little bit of a difference there, but I don't know. So I think yeah. what, what Dr. Mike's kind of getting at there too, is like uh, auto regulation is still king, even for some of these latter exercises. And then at that point you just know like, okay, well, I'm just going to do what I can in some of these. So we already mentioned like the AM and PM is probably a good solution to this problem. When you find that you are maybe kind of getting into that that session level systemic MRV. Another option that you can play around with is just increasing the muscle frequency per week. Maybe not necessarily increasing the number of days, but just shortening up each one of those sessions and then just training. Like if your chest day drains you so much that you can't do triceps, just do more frequent chest and have each one of those sessions be a little bit less so that by the time you get to triceps, you're not as drained, right? And that might be- That also allows one of the sessions to have triceps first to do your coal mine and the canary MRV detection. Exactly. So, you know, splitting up either in terms of more sessions per day or a higher frequency per week within the same sessions per week is probably a really good way to work around the kind of a systemic MRV limitation. But I'm looking at your numbers and like, I see where I see what you're saying. But I, you know, if that was me, I wouldn't be like overly concerned about that. I'd be like, yeah, it's a little bit less. Yeah. But that's that's, that's I mean, that, that, it's like within the noise that I would expect, like, like sure. you mentioned, it's, it's noisy. And yeah, that's uh, another thing is this. If you get to your tricep extensions late in your workout and you feel like dog shit from the other stuff and you're already trembling and you underperform, okay, look, that's fucking systemic fatigue. If you feel great and you still underperform, eh, maybe it's just your triceps, right? But again, we don't know. So we have to train your triceps fresh to find out. That's where it really comes. And I will say, sorry, real quick, James. Um, yeah, no, you're good. Uh, you got bench press and incline dumbbell press as the first and third exercise on both of those days. Look, if your triceps are really actually overreached, those numbers are going down. You're not bench pressing <laughs> yeah. PRs with a fucking overreached tricep. So, um, and also too, I think sometimes using kind of some of not the, uh, ghetto MEV indicators in the sense of detecting MEV, but using things like mind muscle connection pumps, things like that. Like if you, like, if you go through this whole day, and you get to, uh, you do your jam press and you feel good and you get to push downs and your triceps are feeling kind of flat and blah, like just don't do the push downs. Just add another day of triceps later on in the week, right? Because you're probably maybe tapping out what you can get out of your triceps at that point from that day. So not a big deal. Yep. Excellent question. Hopefully the answer makes sense. 
Daniel Hacker is back. If one back is an hack. intermediate, back to hack. If one is an intermediate or advanced lifter going from a physique focus to a sport, does the sport activity, assuming its physical nature, affect their individual muscular MDs? And so if how the individual would be isocalorically, <laughs> isocaloric. Uh, yes, because depending on the sport, you could have less or more stimulus to the muscle than they're used to. So mm -hmm. for example, like if you're training neck for hypertrophy, just make a real simple example, uh, you have a certain MV for neck. Uh, and then if you switch to your sport being wrestling, all of a sudden your sport practice is probably MEV plus for neck. <laughs> so it can definitely affect your MV. It really just depends on the sport involvement. Uh, same for legs and, and arms and so on and so forth. So uh, absolutely they can affect the individual muscle stuff. It yeah, depends on how much they work. It's so like, just to give kind of a slightly different example from what Dr. Mike gave. So if you went from like training for, you know, physique related outcomes, and then you switch to something like volleyball, well, volleyball, actually doing volleyball will definitely hit an MV might actually be MRV for a little while on your legs, but then maybe not nearly enough for the rest of your upper body at all. Right. So there's, there's going to be some, some big differences in a lot of the different sporting activities, something like, uh, um, like jujitsu, like you get so much like bicep and grip and like back and stuff like that. Like you can imagine how, how those muscles would be affected, but it might not be great for something like your legs, you know? So there's, but it definitely, all those things definitely could contribute to hitting an MD. Yep. All right. As I move through my massing macro cycle after start of meso three, I'm curious if introducing a bit too much exercise variation for certain body parts. I'm curious if I'm introducing too much exercise variation. Please shit test the following. Chest meso one, two variants, flat inclined dumbbell press for three to seven sets each. Meso two, three variants, more flat inclined dumbbell pressing volume, four to seven sets each, and a bit of flies. Meso three, five variants, less flat and inclined dumbbell press, bench pressing three to four sets each, some flat inclined barbell pressing three to five sets each. Ooh, you've introduced barbell pressing on meso three, and I would not recommend that. In a higher rep range. In Daniel's, pressing. in his defense, I think I think this came up a long time ago, but I think he mentioned that barbell pressing just wasn't a great move. Ah, uh, that's right, and it's not super fatiguing for him. Uh, a couple of sets of flies, but more reps in weight than the previous mezzo. Uh, aiming to follow the variation adjustment RP video, my rationale is that the dumbbell presses are still working, but going back up to six to seven sets is too much for me for a third consecutive accumulation in a row, so why not introduce a bit more pressing variation and further set the table for succeeding muscles of higher volume barbell pressing, being that I haven't done this move in a few months and probably need a nuzzle anyway to get back into the groove. We'll have a mini cut to follow uh, with two more mass muscles after that. I think it's totally fine. Um, variation is really good for when you have volume to fill and you just don't want to do the same movements anymore to film that greater volume. That's it. So like, if you're like, Hey, someone's like, Hey, why are you adding leg presses? And your answer is because I don't want to do eight sets of squats twice a week. I just want to do eight sets of squats once a week. That's totally fine reason. So if, if you feel that otherwise, if you kept the variation lower, your set numbers for other stuff uh, would be way too high for your liking, variants are totally cool. And, you know, I think one of the problems that you get with a lot of advanced athletes is the reason why they're advanced is because they built up so much adaptive resistance over time. And what you end up finding is that they're like intra-session MAV for any given movement ends up just getting kind of small where it's like, okay, they got their best pumps, my muscle connections, everything from three or four sets. And then everything after that kind of falls flat. So then the need for having some other movements in there to get that same level of stimulus of pump, my muscle connection and all that stuff, you just need to do something else, right? Because you've already done everything for so long that it's very difficult to kind of keep things novel and unique. So yeah. uh, I, I would say like, um, again, that's more of a needs basis. Like you, you don't have to increase up to like that level of five variants unless there's kind of a, a, a dictate for it. But if it's something that you're playing around with and you're having good success with, I don't, I don't see a problem with it either. I think that's fine. Yeah. The, the problem, you, I take that back. There is a problem in, the, the, in conserving long-term variation from using more variants than necessary, but yeah. you, you don't you, do it needlessly. And you'll yeah. Fine. Yeah. And you can work around that, but what we don't like to see is like, I do two sets of flies, then two sets of bench, then two sets of dips, then two sets yes. of push-ups. We're like, why don't you just do three sets of all those? I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, don't do that. Yeah. Steve Blair says, hey, docs, a few miscellaneous quick fire questions. Number one for variation. I'm thinking bam, of, bam, 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 bam. We're like, Z, 55, <laughs> Madeline Albright. Okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Battle of the Bulge. Shit. <laughs> That's always one. Right? Um. For very, dude, I just watched uh, another episode of uh, one of the two World War II in color series on Netflix. Dude, the Battle of the Bulge was doomed from the beginning, man. Like, they were always going to lose that shit. Hitler's just completely fucking insane at that point. And he, like, just ignored all of his generals. Dude, I keep, 
I don't know what it is. I haven't started that one. I always see it and I always download a bunch of episodes and then I just never watch them. And then I always James, go back. you're going on a long flight. I would download the fuck out of those episodes. That's what I'm saying. I always do that. And then when I'm on the flight, I'm like, I'll just watch something dumb. Like, oh, I'm going to watch that new Aladdin oh. movie. And I'm like, why did I watch that? <laughs> That's so James. I know. Just doing it's so something stupid. Just, why did I do that? Um, James, do you have your phone next to you? Yeah. Can you do me a fucking rock solid, like the biggest solid ever? Sure. Can you send me a text real quick and say mm-hmm. download WW2 color? Because um, I'm going to fucking do that now that I have that great idea. Usually I just watch the movies that they give you on the TV. But like, uh, man, I fucking I love that show. And I watch it like once every three months, uh, half an episode at a time. And I'm tired of that shit. Yeah, yeah. Netflix is great because they allow you to, to download offline on your devices, man. It's so cool. So I'm going to do season two of Altered Carbon. I liked the first one. It was a little weird. I've heard good things. Yeah, it's out there. It's kind of like uh, if you took like, what's it, uh, like Total Recall, Blade Runner, and then like mashed it up with, uh, oh shit, I had another movie. I can't Johnny Mnemonic. <laughs> yeah, maybe. It's very sci-fi. It's very kind of like, I would, I would say it like looks like Blade Runner. It's plot's kind of similar to Total Recall. It's cool. Cool. Very cool. cool. All right. For, okay, number one for Mr. Steve Blair. For variation, I'm thinking of trying very close grip parallel pull downs as lat movement. Bro talk has it the closer grips emphasize the arms more than the lats. I that's love that. That's not necessarily one. true um, because the lats get a bigger stretch for the close grip than wide grip, so that's cool. Um, they get less of a peak contraction, so there's that, but it's, it's not. It's not. Oh, really sorry. Cool. He said close grip parallel? It, yeah. Oh, I was thinking Just close grip underhand, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, since the goal would be to target my lats, would this be an effective lat movement or would I be better sticking to wider grips to reduce the chance of my arms becoming a limited factor? Listen, Steve, you never have to ask us a question like this and I'm not trying to bully you or saying uh, that we're not going to answer your question because we absolutely are. You follow your stimulus to fatigue ratio, man. You should always try stuff, always. Because we, James and I can never ever fucking tell it. Look, if you ask like, hey, should I do curls for lats or lat holdouts? You're like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Of course, lat holdouts. <laughs> but like different, James and I would almost never say like, don't do this machine or that grip. Because people feel differently, man. Like what Charlie and Charlie is my training partner, and uh, Charlie, like him and I, will literally use different grips when doing the same exercise because he feels some better than others, and I feel some better than others. There's, there's totally. that's how specific it is, and that's how little it matters too. It's all about comfort and engagement and what your best and most fatigue ratio is. Absolutely try it, and look at you'll know within two sets if your arms are the limiting factor versus your lats. So, and yes, yeah, but. Parallel grip is an interesting one too because it tends to be a very strong grip for a lot of people. So you can, it's like a very good movement in terms of like force output. Uh, like for me personally, parallel grips fuck my elbows up. So I, do, I use them very seldomly because they tend to exacerbate like elbow joint stuff. And that could be just because I have freak, freakishly long arms or whatever, but everybody's a little bit different. I do like the close grip lat variations personally. And that again, it could be because I have long arms, but that for me seems to engage my lats a little bit better than the wide grips, but the wide grips work okay too. Yeah. Number two, I'm just finishing up my mini cut and they've been able to more or less maintain reps for all body parts except triceps, which seems to have tanked the past two weeks. So everything else is okay. I'm guessing systemic fatigue isn't an issue, correct? And they've never felt um, particularly sore at any point. So I'm wondering if it's local fatigue thing, too much volume, or if I'm losing muscle, too little volume. I know it's not much information to go on, but if you had to guess, would you suggest trying more or less volume next time I cut? Or maybe suggest other indicators I could check to try to make a small, to try to make a call. I would check the SFR proxies, um, the amount of a pump you get, uh, the amount of uh, soreness you get, the amount of uh, t- uh, you know uh, t- uh, tension detect, and the amount of your metabolite summation you get, uh, burn, how much burn you get in high reps. If your tricep training seems effective for that, and you know it's above uh, maintenance volume, then you should probably be good to go. And some muscles just uh, genetically have a tendency to slough off more when you cut. I, I've known folks that just lose one or two body parts uh, more than others every time they cut, and that just may be something you have to deal with. Yeah, and it might be uh, similar to the, the previous question where we had where the person might just like it for the session level, like doing the cut might just put you into that systemic, the session level systemic MRV, whereas like on maintenance calories, it really w- it wasn't. So it could be just enough to kind of squish your systemic. And then those latter exercises are just not doing so hot. It doesn't matter if it's triceps or biceps or anything else. It's just the ones at the end are just not going to be as good. Yep. Number three, I typically work out quite late in the evening and then have a very large meal post-workout before going to bed. I know there's no rush for super fast digesting protein post-workout, but presumably my huge meal would take a long time to digest. 
but this delay protein absorption a bit too much. Almost certainly not if you're eating whole food protein, unless you eat like a hundred grams of fat with your meal, you're, you're going to be just fine. So yum, just yum. eat your normal protein, you'll be hundred percent fine. Yeah. Especially for like, if it's going to be one of the last meals you have anyway, because then you're just going to bed and whatever. Number four, I'm allergic to dairy. So I've been using egg white powder as a delicious, albeit frothy replacement for whey. Just out of curiosity, do you know if egg white powder is fast or slow digesting? I think it's somewhere in between, but I think it's faster uh, than slower. Uh, don't quote me on that. I've seen conflicting information. Fuck, I don't know, man. I, I don't know that offhand. But I know I, that the digestion speed is minimal. Look. Yeah, digestion speed is a minimal factor outside of like, you know, sport performance, uh, intracession, and uh, egg white protein is super, super high quality. So it sounds great. Either way, I don't think it's a huge fuss. So if it's something that's working for you, yep. keep doing it. Yep. All right. Anch says, I really used to like to say Anchiman Radhakrishnan. But you know, I just get, I, I, it's a long name to type and there's always prone to typos. So I'm like, you know Oh, what? I see. Okay. So you just shortened it for him. We all know who Anch is. Hey docs, hope you're doing well. Fat loss diet is officially halfway over. 5% body weight down, 5% to go. That's really awesome. It's been really soon so far. Hunger has only started to creep in during the last week or so, and I've um, only needed to make one calorie cut so far. Training for the most part is going amazing, maintaining or gaining strength on all lifts except for bench, uh, which brings me to one of my questions for the week. Holy Past bench experience, questions this week. I'm inclined. Haha. <laughs> no. uh. I'm inclined to suspect that I reliably can't maintain my bench press strength in the five to 10 rep range when cutting, join the club. Mm. Uh, pretty much every time I cut for an extended period of time, bench goes to shit pretty quickly. Other chest movements, including the more isolated movements like machine flies, uh, will generally be going much smoother and the higher rep ranges. I have bench program in the five to 10 range on one day and 10 to 20 another. I maintain strength well. Would you guys agree that this is likely just a local issue in the bench press and unlikely to be indicative of any chest muscle mass decrease? Yeah, look, if you yes. other... Yeah, you lose muscle mass, you lose in every single rep range. Okay, it's just the most unequivocal thing ever. Someone's like, hey, you hit me PRs, you're like, nope, I'm weaker, <laughs> right? Um, so this, this, it's just it's a so chest common thing. too. It's or, so sorry, common. It's just, yeah, it's super I, common. Um, I would say do very little or no five to 10 rep range training when you're cutting. Yeah, or uh, the bench is just one you take a hit on when you lose weight. And yeah. it, it's hard because like sometimes we'll have people who are like, oh, I need to like do my powerlifting meet and I don't want to. You know, I got like 30 pounds to lose. It's oh, like, wait, hey, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> got bad news for you. My second question is about the utility of bodybuilding peaking methods when not at ultra lean levels of body fat. The end of my cut is going to coincide nicely with the end of our semester of spring fling. Girl. Oh, boy. Outdoor concert where everyone gets wasted in parties. You know, something you want to peak for, huh? Um, <laughs> I'm thinking of using this as a good time to show off some shreds. My dog. Oh, man. He's, he's spring flinging it around. Yep. I'm definitely going to be at my all-time leanest, I think, in hopefully in the 10 to 12% body fat range. Um, I think uh, – Ansh, I'm sorry. I forgot where you – I think Ansh goes to school at Yale or something. Like, you're going to be the most jacked dude at Yale for sure. <laughs> um <laughs> So motherfucking Harry Potter's running around and shit. <laughs> I would benefit, uh, would I benefit at all from trying to, uh, some peaking strategies or does basically be wasted since I'm being too fat for any noticeable effect. I also figure that I might yield some data that could be useful down the line if I ever compete in bodybuilding. Thanks. You know, Ansh, sure, here's the deal. I, what I think would be cool is if you employed some peaking strategies uh, to do a cool peak the morning of that event and take some awesome pictures, then you could look noticeably better. So yeah, all the normal peaking strategies work pretty well. I just would do a lot of them. Just, just keep them, you know, raise your carbs a little bit in the last couple of days, lower your salt and water a little bit. And then you wake up that morning and you look super awesome basically for the, and then, and then just have some good meals. Don't eat anything that'll bloat you to crazy, but just have good meals, relax. And then later that night, go to spring fling, take a shirt off, whatever the fuck. And you know, get the orgy. Um, don't expect to look your best at the spring fling, but who gives a shit? First of all, people are so drunk they can't fucking see anything. And if you look remotely jacked, they're not going to be able to detect a one or two percent difference. Second of all, you're going to be fucking drinking and having fun, and so your peak is over as soon as you fucking start drinking because God knows what happens to your physique at that point. And also, it's probably an outdoor concert where everyone gets wasted in parties. I don't know what time that is, but it's I don't know if it's in the middle of the day or at night. Like at night, nobody can see your body anyway. But I would absolutely do a peaking uh, plan and 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 a very gentle one, um, and uh, take some pictures in the gym earlier that day and after. After you hit the gym, go have a meal, and then get with your friends and start drinking like you just want to end it all. And drink, drink, huh. drink. And one-to-one -one correlation between drinking and partying fun. So there's no such thing as too much alcohol. That was all a joke, by the way, folks. But yeah, have fun with your friends. And um, just don't stab anybody in the throat like you did at the last intergalactic party. 
intergalactic. Uh, yeah, I think I'm all for uh, doing trial runs for things that you might want to do serious runs of later. So if you are thinking about ever competing in bodybuilding or any physique sports and you want to practice doing some of these peaking protocols, it's a perfect opportunity to do that. So I would, I would say like, if you're not thinking about competing, then it might just be like an over, overly complicated use of your time. But if you are, it's definitely a, a great time to trial and error a few things and see how it goes or at least gain what we would call competitive experience. Like, so you're, yeah. you're at least like kind of in the game, you know what it feels like to do some of these things, even if it doesn't go great, like, yeah, just know what it feels like. Cole Dano says, Hey, my non-medical doctor friends, a couple of strength related questions. Noise. My understanding with strength training is that you want to leave a little overhead and not actually reach MR, a MRV. Say after a mass cycle, you found you can do 10 sets of chest before hitting MRV. Is there a rule of thumb you can uh, use to translate to strength training? In other words, if I did 10 sets of chest in a mass cycle, would five sets be a good amount of strength work? You really can't tell until you try, but uh, you usually think something like two thirds uh, is usually set per set what your strength MRV is versus your uh, hypertrophy MRV. Is. Yeah. And, and so just to kind of tidy that up, it's not so much that you don't reach an MRV. It's just that your strength MRV is significantly less sure. than your uh, hypertrophy. So I would say for kind of general strength, like, you know, roughly four to eight reps, two thirds is probably a good starting place. And then adjust from there for maximal strength. It's probably more like 50%, maybe even less. Yeah. Uh, if so, how dependent is it on rep range? Um, so five to seven uh, reps uh, versus three to five versus one to three. Yeah. Just so basically five to seven reps, it's going to be very similar MRV. Uh, maybe 90% of what you usually do, uh, three to five reps, it's going to be like 66%. And then one to three, it's going to be like 50% as far as sets are concerned, uh, maybe even lower. Yeah. And those are just guesstimates based on our experience. It's not yeah. like a hard, hard rule. Yeah. Uh, Chad Wesley Smith is someone you might want to look into for more particular answers on that. He's kept track a lot of that for a lot of his athletes. And then he says, drop sets for strength work, question mark. Say you're doing five sets in the five to seven rep range. But set four, you only hit four reps. Is taking weight off the bar for the next set an effective strategy? No, because you're no. training force production. You don't want to reduce force. You're not basically saying, I'm still going to train the same volume, but reduce force. That's literally backwards. Um, you would do that for hypertrophy, not for strength. Or is it better to just stop training for the day and plan on only doing four sets next week? Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, or reevaluate your fatigue. Or like... Uh it's not a terrible idea to just add a set. And even if it's, you know, a little bit outside of the rep range, like, totally. it's not, yeah, it's not yeah. the end of the world, especially if you do know, like you have a, a definite, have like a volume quota for your strength work that you're trying to hit. Yep. And you, what I would do is if, if that's the case, then just you would use, if you wanted to be in the five to seven rep range and you got like six, five, four, that just means you started okay. a little too heavy, you know, yep. and then you would adjust. A quick progress report. I took your advice and started a maintenance strength block uh, early last December in a strength cycle. Like you say, it took the first measure to get the feel back, but the following measures went great. And even after losing 12 kilograms in the previous cup, yes. my strength has actually gone up. Wow. And I had some great PRs. Yes. After the diet, I've only put on 1.5 kilos and eating a maintenance at this weight feels just right. My original plan was to do another cut starting about now, but due to some knee issues, I don't think a cut is a good idea. So I'll go into a mass phase work on getting some more muscle on my legs. I couldn't be happier with the progress though. And I owe a big thanks to you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, by the well way, here James is working on something related to volume line rocks or sport. This is awesome. I'm really looking <laughs> forward to it. I got a little look at that rough draft and I thought James, James told me he was uh, playing around with some ideas. Turns out motherfucker had written like 60 pages already. So I was like, holy shit. Uh, it's a hell of a rough draft. Um, it's going to be a fucking awesome book and I will be the, core editor for it. James is going to be the lead author and we've got some other uh, fine folks working on it. It's going to be an awesome book if I may say so myself. Thank you very much. I'm excited. Yeah. So we're going to tackle all sorts of issues like that. Super. All right. A very unusual, but very fun question from Cole Ishikawa. And then we get to uh, our YouTube content real quick. So Cole says, hey, Doc, it's not a training question, but what is the proper gym etiquette while waiting for a piece of equipment? Should I stand really close, ask how many sets left, try to work in? Try not to be a dick, but also try not to wait while bro does five exercise superset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uh, superset is, is definitely bad etiquette when it's clear that the gym is relatively. Yeah, for big. sure. Or like the five superset bullshit. Um, and then he says, uh, we'll get the joke out of the way now. Also reverse pyramid training thoughts. I'm kidding. Thanks as always. Oh my God. Um, all right. So there's a, I have a modus operandi. I'll share mine and James will share his and we'll see where we stand. James is like, I just punched the dude in the throat watch. Um, so uh, what I do is I never talk to anyone during their set. Um, 
I had a gentleman ask me if I was using a certain piece of equipment while I was curling. So just didn't say anything back because I was curling. And he was like, he's, he was like, uh, like puta or something like that. And then he like walked off with a, with a bench. And, you know, since I'm like geared up to shit uh, and hadn't done jujitsu in a few days, I was like, God, please help me not fucking end this motherfucker's career. But like, I didn't do anything. And I just, it just whatever. People are crazy. So, so first of all, don't ask people anything during the set. Okay. Only after the set. And I, if they really look like the resting is good, like right after the set, which is like, hey, how many sets do you have? You know, give people their breathing room, right? Um, and just be like, hey, um, how many sets do you have? Okay. If they say one or two sets, just wait. Okay. If they say like five sets, then you say, hey, do you mind if I work in? Okay. Now they could say, I'd rather you didn't. And then, it, then you know, then you're not working in because, you know, civility is number one in modern society. Um, but if uh, they almost always say like, yeah, totally. You know, because if, even if they're doing a superset, they're just going to be like, well, I'm doing a superset. And be like, well, let me hit it when you're not hitting it. And you let me know when you need it. And I'll just jump the fuck off, right? Let's, let's work in. Um, if it's somebody, and so this handles 99% of all cases. Sometimes somebody will say, hey, listen, like, um, you know, I'm doing a superset and then it's clearly they're just not using it. And then they tell you every time they don't want to work in. At some point, you'd be like, hey, man, like, I noticed you're usually just not using this, man. Like, I really, I'll move right out of your way when you need it. But is, is it okay if I work in with you? If they still say no, I'm going to just go up to the gym staff and just report the fuck out of them. Uh, and, and then somebody's going to come up and talk to them. And they might get pissed at you and say, what the fuck, bro? And you say, hey, listen, I'm just trying, just trying to work out like everybody else. And uh, this is kind of cool that packing a gun and or knowing martial arts is sweet. Because if they grow up to you, you'd be like, get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to take this to the police. And as soon as you mention the police, most tough guys are like, oh, Jesus Christ, fuck that. But if they say, oh, police, really pussy? They'd be like, oh, sweet, come to balance, uh, sign a waiver, and I'll fucking rock you into a wall. Or in James's case, you just shoot him in the kneecaps 50 times and go to jail forever. <laughs> we're just joking, by the way. Some people get yeah, really bent out of shape about the gun stuff. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I agree with Mike. That's really good. I do a slight, a modified version of that approach where, um, like, if I go and I see that there's a piece of equipment that is being used and uh, there's no other alternatives immediately available, I will kind of go and hover, but not in a way where I'm staring at the person, like, you know, like just staring them down, like, I want to use this. I'll go make it clear that like I'm in the area and then I'll go maybe sit off to the side and I'll let them do like two or three sets. And you know, at that point it's been like maybe like five minutes. So if they're still going or they're kind of lollygagging, then I'll do what Dr. Mike said and just say like, Hey, you know, are you still working here? Do you mind if I hop in something like that? But usually I found the, the kind of passive aggressive hovering where you like come to the area, make it known like, Oh, I, you're here, but okay, I'm going to go sit over here. <laughs> you're done. Right. I'm not like looking at you. I'm not like, posturing on you i just like uh, it was clear that i wanted that but i'm gonna i'm willing to wait and if they don't say something to you because most people will be like oh did you want to like work in or something like that and you go yeah great okay sweet um so i'll sit off to the side wait for a couple sets and if there's if they're just doing the all day thing or if they're just texting on their phone then i'll do the same procedure that dr mike did just be like hey you mind if i work in and almost every time they'll say either i got one set left you mind waiting or yeah come on let's work in yep <laughs> All right, to YouTube, shall I throw this on? Go for it. Boom. Share. Screen share. Cool, got it? Got Looking it. Looking good? Okay, sweet. Good. Oh, carpet's uh, back. Yeah, you yeah just, <laughs> just one uh, thing. So SSD, Abel, that's Abel, Cybi. Uh, I have no idea how to say Abel's name, last name. Sorry, Abel. He says, uh, he's talking about Greg Doucette stuff when I went on a mini rant. He said, I think Mike saw the wrong stuff from Greg Doucette. Sure, he's not Eric Helms, but he, but he talks about him as if he was Satan himself. He actually has pretty good advice usually. Uh, he totally does, man. Greg Doucette has mostly very good advice, very sound advice. Um, he definitely knows what he's doing. Unfortunately, he often has advice that's so bad and that's so terribly reasoned. If you don't really, don't really know what you're talking about, so Abel, you're real smart, and you certainly know more than Greg uh, Doucette on almost everything training related. You can actually parse <laughs> apart what is good advice and what is bad because you know what's bad and what's good. Like Most you people sli- don't know you slide that. the neg in there just like- For just sure. Just well, I mean it, right? So you know, for people who already know stuff, he's uh, first of all, you're really entertaining. And second of all, has plenty of good nuggets. And then when he says really dumb shit, you're like, ah, it's just Greg. Um, most people don't know that. So they'll just learn stuff from him that's fucking wrong. And they just don't know because they think he's right about everything. So you could have said the same thing about like somebody like uh, uh, Charles Polkwin. So he's, he's full of really great stuff. He was, and he was full of tons of bullshit too. So I just wouldn't recommend him. Yeah, nobody's Eric Helms. You know, uh, so if you have a choice, Eric Helms or Greg Dissett, Eric Helms is somebody I would watch all the time. And because you have like 500 other YouTubers that are super good, uh, you know, yeah, you can watch Greg Dissett, but I would keep him mostly for entertainment, not for a ton of insight. Because again, you don't know what the insight is because he's wrong so grandiosely too many times. 
Um, and then a couple of people just say bad things about Greg and defend me. Was, Thank you so much, folks. Um, uh, I honestly, I wouldn't be so, uh, so butthurt about the Greg thing if he didn't willfully misrepresent me. And then the debate went totally out of context. So I look like the mean guy, even though he was talking shit. Um, and also because he literally admitted that he just does YouTube for money and he doesn't care that he misrepresents anything or says the wrong thing because his followers are idiots and he doesn't give a shit. Um, for the love of God, that's a bad faith actor. <laughs> so just, yeah. I don't know how to. Definitely a charlatan, right? Like, yeah, super fucked up. So anyway. When you um, admit that you just do stuff for, for clickbait, like. Yeah, it's like literally, like he has a video now. It's like, uh, it just popped up on my feed. It's like, is Jeff side like natty or not? It's got like 300,000 views or some shit. <laughs> God it's damn it. Like, like, yeah. It's pissed me off. So yeah, bad. it's just like, it's just oh. the bottom of the fucking barrel. It's just pure speculation. It's like hilarious. Uh, and it's just smearing too. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like just saying like, is so-and-so a Nazi? Like, well, you've already like painted a picture without even like, you know, just with the title alone. Yep. All right. First real question from Pico Rodriguez says, I'm pretty jacked, but not fit. How do I get above decent cardio uh, without losing my gains? Or do I have to pick? I want to play soccer with my son and his team. Um, Patrick Barney already took a shot at the title here. James, what do you think? Super quick answer here for Pico. Uh, you don't have to pick. Like uh, the thing is like, if you are, are already jacked, like you can just keep doing mostly what you're doing and adding a little bit of cardio, like two times a week is not going to impact your gains in any like tangible way, unless your goal is to have like the biggest legs and calves on the planet. Um, so yeah, man, you can just pick up a little bit of cardio. It might make you a little more tired. So maybe scale down some of your weight training stuff, but most people can tolerate adding like two days of cardio, 20 to 30 minutes of pop, like mostly no big deal. So you probably don't have to pick one or the other. Do both. I will also say lose some fat. You'll get fit real fast and you'll sacrifice nothing. A lot of times people carrying 10, 15 pounds extra fat. If they dump it, they can play soccer way, way better. Totally true. Okie dokie. Ooh, this is a good question. Matthew Pearsall says, I'm unsure how to track foods where the macros and calories don't align due to fiber and sugar. Alcohol is the net carb problem. Do I count all the carbs or just some of them? Thanks for your help. Love the webinars. There's actually a very simple answer to this. Uh, this is the most like straightforward way to do it. Um, or rather than straightforward, this is the most uh, close to accurate way to do it. Uh, there's a couple other ways we can talk about. The first way is you count fiber as zero carbs and you count sugar alcohols as half the carbs that they're listed at because that's very close to how much they actually end up uh, costing you. Uh, now, there's two other options. One, you can count uh, all of them for zero, possible, or you can count uh, all of them for full, possible. Whichever method you pick for whatever mesocycle or macrocycle or really diet phase, like your entire cut, use the same method. Okay, because if you alter methods, you don't know what the fuck's going in your body. So I would say count fiber for zero and count sugar alcohols for half of what they are. Like if it's four grams of sugar alcohols, you count two grams of carbs. Um, but uh, whatever method you choose, stick to that one, James. Yeah, absolutely. So in the, in the counting macros for diet situation, consistency is greater than accuracy. It doesn't have to be perfect. As long as you do the same stuff, it's a wash over time. So you'll change. If you're not losing weight, you bring stuff down. If you're not gaining weight, you bring stuff up. It doesn't matter how you did it as long as you do it consistently. Okay, this is uh, this is cool. Well, uh, this is super off topic, but we'll take a shot. Let's uh, make this. Our let's let's third just question. let's skip that one. Are you sure? Yeah, let's just. God, leave it's it full alone. of so much wrong shit, though. I know. Uh, let's just leave it alone. Like we can. I know. Let's. You know, I've had enough. Uh, you, you, I'm sure you already saw. I had enough social media drama this week. Can I give like a super super quick, and then we'll just drop it super just. If just, if you don't mind, I'd like to just let this one go. Fuck. Sorry, Lorenzo. I know, is I know your fucking you feel, lucky day. I know you feel passionate about me. I do too. But let's just let it go. Are you still there? Yes. Oh, sorry. You just like were perfectly still. I was like, Jesus, did it just freeze up? It is the ultimate way to get killed. And this is extremely Mike, problematic advice. Here, leave it alone. Ah! Leave it alone. Self-righteousness. Okay. Leave, sorry. Leave it alone. Sorry. Sorry. Do it for me. I've had enough I will. social media issues okay. this week. <laughs> You're welcome, Lorenzo. You're welcome. Uh, okay. Um, here we go. Let's pick a good one. Oh, can I just tackle uh, real quick? Go back up a little higher, please. Uh, Roman Meyer. 
uh, I think this is in response. I think he said, like, why are you wearing a backpack? And I said, oh, I'm wearing a weighted vest. James Krieger actually just posted his, like, whole research on the weighted vest stuff. It's really, really interesting. I, I think it's just on either his, his social media or his website, but he posted it for free, which is, like, really cool and really awesome of him. So check it out. I really encourage you guys to take a look. I had a, I had a positive experience with the weighted vest stuff. Um, not saying it's the end-all, be-all, but it's definitely something worth exploring. Yeah. Um, let's do one more because that one's really short. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Kyle Luriero. Oh, that's a tough last name to say. I was listening to one of RP, uh, past RP web webinars, and I think one of you guys said that it was possible to get strong and improve sprinting while focusing on strength training for the lower body. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely improve, it gets strong. Uh, also possible to improve sprinting. My goal is to try to improve sprinting for soccer and strength, namely on squats and deadlifts. So I guess it would be able to train with low rep ranges and low relative intensities. Besides that, um, what would you guys recommend for exercise variation? What type of cardio would be ideal? So the cardio question is difficult to answer because if you're, if you're improving sprinting for soccer, I would just say playing soccer like games and where soccer itself is the best cardio. And then the uh, cardio question is also super expanded because we don't really know what other factors you're trying to push. Are you trying to also increase cardio, but the sprinting should be, I guess you got your sprinting uh, figured out, uh, but exercise variations. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you could try some power movements and some loaded jumping as well, but generally speaking, you know, high bar squats, front squats, um, uh, leg presses where you dynamically move and then uh, various pulls, uh, stiff legged deadlifts, good morning, stuff like that to train the hamstrings even more so than regular deadlifts are really good options for increasing sprint speed. That's where I would start James. Yeah. So on the, the running stuff, um, in, in terms of cardio, this is something I was just working on. It's no secret that I was, I'm working on this other book and this came up in a lot of the uh, different sections that I was working on. So one of the things that's worth noting for field sports in particular is people say like, Oh, it's really aerobic. Oh, it's really anaerobic. It's actually a hybrid of both. It's a high intensity intermittent activity where uh, most of the time you're doing like burst, rest, burst, rest, burst, rest type stuff. And so this is what causes a lot of confusion for strength conditioning coaches where they're like, well, there's a burst. So you got to train the sprint, right? Like, yeah, but, but then there's the, you have to keep doing it. So then you have to be like really aerobically fit, right? Yeah. So like uh, the problem is that they tend to merge those two things together. Really what you want to do is separate those two energy systems in terms of like how you approach that type of training. So for example, when you do sprint training, at least some, if not a large portion of it is actually to get really fast at accelerating or changing direction, right? So for soccer, your average kind of sprint distance is going to be probably around 20 meters. I know rugby is 20 meters more often than not. So I'm guessing soccer's it's pretty similar, probably maybe 30 meters, 20 meters, something in there. It's not going to be like 60 meters, right? So it's going to be mostly stop and go type stuff. So you have to get really good at accelerating and decelerating. On the other hand, then you train the energy systems involved, which is kind of the more cardio component where you're doing high intensity intermittent stuff. So you have like bursts, short rest bursts. So some people will do like repeated sprint ability stuff where they'll do um, sprints with like 30 second rest and they'll look at the drop off in terms of time, stuff like that. That works really good. You can do high intensity interval training stuff with the uh, kind of similar work to rest ratios that you see in soccer. Any of those things would be great. People just tend to conflate like the anaerobic running component and the more like, um, high intensity intermittent running components. So you would want to treat those two things separately is what I'm saying. And I think that's where a lot of people get messed up where they're like, which one do I pick? It's like, well, you have a distinct day that you're meant to be fast and a distinct day where you're meant to try and go as hard as you yep. can for as long as you can. Yep. Yep. Big, big, big part is the distinction. Mix it all up, James. Fuck it. The salad bowl approach to training. Shit's you get a whole lot of nothing. Just get yeah. fit. Man, we did um, uh, two hours today. That was pretty good. Yeah. It was a doozy. Ooh, uh, God, ugh. that Lorenzo Vrojic. I know. I, you know what? Respectfully disagree. All good, my man. No worries. Uh, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So, uh, housekeeping. That's it. That's it for this week. Uh, guys, next week, Mike and I are going to be on vacation. And normally when we travel, we're working. This is like one of the few times we get to travel and be on vacation. We might try and do a webinar while we're gone, but we also might try and just do vacation. So we yep. probably are going to have a week off and then we'll get back in the following week onto our normal weekly schedule. So please keep posting questions in the yep. forums. We'll keep, we'll keep doing that. Post them on YouTube too. When this comes out, post all your questions and we'll answer it next time. Yep. So this was actually, we had some really good, uh, again, good, good thought provoking yep. questions. If you guys enjoy our stuff, don't be afraid to uh, give it a like. I like, we're pretty consistent on the YouTube videos where it's like, we'll have like 60 likes and like one thumbs down. I'm like, who is, oh, somebody is subscribing oh, and thumbs downing. Who's uh, so I've been told that Lyle McDonald thumbs down every video that uh, his various enemies are in. 
Um, uh, he go. thumbed down every Revive Stronger video ever, except for the one. <laughs> You're gonna thumb just, you're gonna thumbs down Steve. Come on, man. Oh, he actually called Steve and Pascal like cocksuckers and retards in an email. Like, uh, yeah, Steve Hall. What a cocksucker! The, 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 the nicest person of all time. Well, you know, Lyle's one of the good guys, right? Yeah. Um, well, if you want to subscribe and give us a thumbs down, I understand, but I would prefer that you subscribe and give us a thumbs up. That's great. <laughs> if we didn't earn the thumbs up, that's on us, and we'll try and do better. Yeah, but, just be uh, honest. For now, I think we're gonna wrap this one up. Talk to you guys till next time. Peace. <laughs>